Hey there, Dave here. And before we get into today's episode about Lisa the Painful, do want to have a couple of announcements before the show. First of all, you may notice a bit of audio crackle in the episode. We all do our best with these remote podcast situations. We never know when the computer is going to rebel against us. So unfortunately, there's a bit of that. It's very minor. I don't think that it affects the quality of the conversation at all. And this is a wonderful discussion. So please bear with us on that. Also, I want to say thank you to the wonderful patrons who help support the show. These fine folks are Chris Nelson, the Top 3 Podcast crew, Chris Copleen, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, Nick Vacori, Jill, Jeff, formerly Jerf, Kieran, Soccer, ZNA, Cupcake, Kyle, Christian S., Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, JD, Doug Leaf, Jason Emery, Brian Skersha, Randall, Jake Martin, Jenny E., Kurt Mattis, and many more. Your generous support is much appreciated. And if you're listening, you are thinking, hey, I like this show. How can I be like them? Well, you can do that at patreon.com slash realdavejackson. All patrons will be able to vote in polls for what games I do on the show each month. And you'll get bonus episodes and, of course, my everlasting love and respect. So with that being said, it's time to work harder with Lisa the Painful. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Jackson, and you're listening to Tales from the Backlog. This is a video games review podcast where each week I'm joined by a guest to bring a game out of the backlog, play it, and discuss. My guest today is a friend of the show, host of Pixel Project Radio Podcast, and Armstrong-style fighting master Rick Firestone. Rick, welcome back. Hey, Dave. It's good to be back. As always, I'm excited about this episode. Uh, This is one of my favorite games of all time. Hell yeah, awesome. I mean, it's no secret, no coincidence why you're on this episode in particular. Uh, So I already knew that it's a game that you really liked, and I'm excited to dig in with you today. The game today is Lisa the Painful, which is an RPG developed and published by Ding-A-Ling Productions for PC in 2014, with ports to just about every console after that. And I want to make a note, Ding-A-Ling Productions is mostly a one-person effort with game design, art, composition, and writing all credited to one person, Austin Jorgensen. So uh, another one of these small team, solo developer type projects here. Uh, always kind of a miracle that games be able to made by be made by just one person. Yeah, and for the definitive edition that just came out uh, a couple months ago at the time of recording, uh, that was involved with, uh, he was involved with Serenity Forge. So they did, right. uh, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. I know they did Doki Doki Literature Club Plus. Right. Yeah, they're a uh, a publishing studio that's worked with a couple other games that I've done on the show. I think they're involved with um, Death's Gambit. Yeah, so uh, some pedigree there as a, a publisher if, with Serenity Forge. So if this is your first time listening to the podcast, first of all, thank you for stopping by. Here's how spoilers work on the show. We're not going to spoil the story of Lisa the Painful or the uh, prequel and the DLC for it. We're not going to spoil that stuff in the non-spoiler portion of the episode. We're going to warn you when the spoilers are going to begin. You can also check down in the show notes for a timestamp for when that starts. So if you don't know... What Lisa the Painful is, we have some elevator pitches. I have a very, very short one. I'm calling this Earthbound's Evil Twin, or maybe it's Evil Descendant or something like that. Uh, Rick, what's the elevator pitch for Lisa the Painful? Okay, Dave, would you believe me if I said I tested this on a real elevator, on a real person? Okay, I would. (laughs) You wouldn't lie about something like that. I like that your first response was okay and not yes or no. <laughs> Just hard no sell immediately. <laughs> okay, it's, it's pretty short. It's, it's not as short as yours, but it's pretty short. Lisa the Painful is a game of excess. It is excessively dark, excessively challenging, and excessively funny. Can a broken, desperate man become whole in a world where optimism ceases to be? Is it possible to rebuild the world and oneself? 
I wholeheartedly recommend Lisa to JRPG fans who are looking for a challenge, a laugh, and introspection. Yeah, all of those things are totally true, and we'll talk about all of those. Uh, the challenge of the game itself, the challenges the characters are going through, the introspection that the story would suggest, uh, and of course, the laughs that we had along the way. So uh, I played this on PC. It took me 14 hours to beat, and I just want to make a note here. I did not play Lisa the First, and I did not play the Joyful DLC, uh, but we will reference those in the spoiler section. I did read up on what happens in those. Uh, so Rick, I know you've played this more times than I have. Uh, how long does a playthrough take you? Did you play the prequel and the DLC? Uh, so this most recent playthrough of The Painful, I did everything except for the new secret boss in the Definitive Edition. And uh, I really took my time and tried to gather as many characters as I could, find as many secrets and Easter eggs as possible. And my playthrough was about 16 and a half hours long. Uh, so not not that much longer than yours. Uh, I did play The Joyful right afterwards uh, before this show. Got to see that to completion, which was really nice. Um, and I have the first. It just released on Steam, like, yeah, I think last month. <laughs> Uh, but I, I have spoiled it for myself in the past, but I haven't actually played it yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when we talk about our personal histories with uh, Lisa the Painful here, my personal history uh, stems from talking with you about the game. So let's get yours first. What initially brought you to this game? Because part of the reason I played this is that it's a game that you think really highly of. Yeah. So I distinctly remember uh, how I heard about Lisa it was, uh, I, I know, I, I know your reaction is going to be, uh, I heard it through video game donkey. Uh, he okay. released a video <laughs> about it <laughs> in early January of 2017. And what donkey is really good at doing in his videos. And especially that one is distilling these games into their most irreverent, uh, sections and, and jokes and, and scenarios without spoiling much of anything. Like, mm -hmm. without context, you have no clue what's going on. And it was the same with Lisa. So I was like, oh, this game is hilarious. I'm going to I'm gonna download it and play it. And I downloaded it on, like, the worst laptop ever. And I played it, and I was <laughs> like, I didn't get very far even because I didn't know it would be so hard. And yeah. at the time, I just put it down. I was like, I, I can't do this. I finished it some years later. Really, really enjoyed the experience. Uh, and then I've played it, I think... Uh, I think this was my third full playthrough of The Painful. So not like a crazy amount of time, but enough to see just about everything, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, we we have our back and forths about uh, Dunkey. I do really enjoy what he has to say and the things he highlights in the videos. I just think he's putting on a voice and you're not going to change my mind. But I, I like Dunkey, uh, what he does. And I have seen clips at least from his video about this uh this game in particular so um for me what brought me to lisa the painful is two major things number one talking about it with you because you're one of the only people out there in our you know shared friend group and stuff that was talking about this like six months ago basically and then the other thing was i heard it on kane and rinse they covered it and they hated this game but the reasons that they hated it kind of piqued my interest a little bit. They didn't like how cruel it was. And I listened to that and I was like, I kind of have different tastes than the people on this podcast. I might want to check this out someday. Uh, I also listened to your episode on Pixel Project Radio with uh, Charlie, former guest on this show. What's up, Charlie? And um, then you actually gifted this game to me on Steam. I was thinking about like, when did I buy this? All right, Rick gave it to me. Wow, what a coincidence. We're going to talk about it on the podcast. So uh, I made sure to put it on the backlog resolutions list for this year uh, with that challenge we're doing in my Discord server where people are trying to make dents in their backlogs. This was one I made sure to put on the list. So that got me to play it. And to do our little opening thoughts here before we dive in proper, I like this game. Um, I thought Number one, uh, as a comedy, I think it's really funny and it's really well written. And that kind of stuff is kind of hard to do in video games. Uh, there's lots of memorable characters and, of course, memorable moments for lots of different reasons. Um, I was also surprised by how good I thought this game was from a mechanical standpoint as an RPG. I did not expect that. 
I thought it to be I thought it would be simple or kind of busted and it's not. It's it's actually pretty solid. Um there's some things when we get to the spoiler section, I have some like questions about the story cuz there's some things that just don't line up to me and there's some things where I don't know what the developer is trying to say here. I don't know what this game is trying to say about certain things. Other things I'm very clear on what it's trying to say and I like some of the messages that's going on here um and I like some of the themes. Uh overall good experience. I did have a good time with it. Um, what would you say here at the top? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, to all listening, uh, just know that if you ever want Dave to do an episode on something, all you've got to do is uh, buy it for him. And, you know, the the guilt takes care of itself. That's right, baby. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I am glad that you really wanted to do an episode on this, though. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I already said that this is one of my favorite games of all time, and I wasn't sure about that going into it. I, I know I knew that I liked this game a lot. And when I went to replay it for this show, I kind of just started thinking like, you know, I really like this. I This is hitting a lot of what I look for in games and in game stories. And by the time I finished it, I was like, yeah, this is no contest top three. I mean, top five, top three. It, it all changes depending on the day sometimes. But it's it it really stands out to me because it is a game that isn't afraid to touch on themes that many other bigger developers certainly uh, shy away from. It doesn't pull its punches and it's, it's just very unapologetic in its presentation and how Mm -hmm. it decides to cover these things. Um, To that point, I, I listened to the Kane and Rince episode too. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Kane and Rince and I, you know, what I love about this game is it can spawn these sorts of discussions. I didn't think anything that they said on that show or that episode, I should say, was off base at all. I I thought everything they brought up was very fair. It just came down to a matter of taste. And that's part of what makes this game so great as a work is it can spawn these conversations. It's not just a one and done thing where people, you know, I, yes, that's right. Or no, that's totally not right. There's so much of a gradient here. And I mean, I, I, I think... Jorgensen did brilliant work. Yeah, agreed that this game is one that like I already knew going into it that it was going in these places. And that's why it was like, well, this should be something to talk about on the show because it's a game that spawns conversations. If no matter who plays this game and what kind of games they like and what kind of themes they like their games to touch on, this game is going to spawn some conversations. So uh, also shout out once again to the Retro Hangover review crew for lots of conversation when this was the game of the month. And it just lined up perfectly that we could play and talk with them and uh, also get ready to do this episode here today. Uh, So we're going to have a lot of uh, things to talk about, especially in the spoiler section. But before we get there, We do have a lot of non-spoiler ground to cover. So we're going to listen to some music, fantastic music in this game, come back and set up the story of Lisa the Painful. In Lisa the Painful, you play as Brad Armstrong. Brad is a middle-aged martial arts instructor in a post-apocalyptic wasteland called Olathe. That's how I'm going to choose to pronounce it. Early in the game, you see a flashback scene where it establishes some of Brad's backstory in his childhood. He's bullied. He's abused by his father. His father's an alcoholic. Brad's life sucks. Flash forward to the modern day, Brad is addicted to a drug called Joy, and he goes out into the uh, wasteland, the post-apocalyptic wasteland, and he finds a baby girl out there. And this is notable because the apocalyptic event in this game's backstory, which is called The Flash, killed all the women in the world. So finding a baby girl out in the wasteland is a big deal. Brad knows that this world uh, full of only men, no women at all, Uh, is not a safe one for a girl, a baby girl. Uh, So he decides to raise her in secret. He names her Buddy. And Buddy grows up under Brad's protection in his house. 
uh, but you can tell that there is some kind of tension there uh, that she wants to go out and see the world. One day, Brad returns home from going out and, you know, doing whatever people do in the day-to-day in this world. He comes home, he finds Buddy is gone, all his friends are dead outside of the house, and so he's off on the quest to find her, and that is where we're going to, like, stop talking about specific story events for now, but that is the story setup for this game. And I got to say, I knew this going in. I think this is a really interesting setup for a post-apocalypse story. There's so much post-apocalyptic media out there that this like, you know, world of men, basically, and some of the things this game touches on is masculinity and things like that with this baby girl. I thought this was a unique start for this story. Very much so. It's one of those story setups where if you say it out loud to somebody that is unfamiliar with it, it's going to raise some eyebrows, right? This is a kind of recommendation where you have to really know somebody before recommending it. I would have never (laughs) recommended this to you, (laughs) to you, um, like before we got to know each other, um, because, you know, on its face, it can sound misogynistic. Um, spoiler alert, it's really not, it really is not at all. And as you mentioned, it does, one of the secondary themes in my opinion in this game is this idea of the dark side of masculinity. Mm -hmm. Um, although we do get one very amazing little hub where it's just, uh, I, I don't know, just (laughs) neutral masculinity, just dudes working out. It's pretty great. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, uh, it's, it's a very bleak game. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the main kind of tones that this story takes is like different situations that come up. If you think of like the bleakest thing that could happen, you're probably not going to be too far off from what actually happens in the game. Although I will say like to the game's credit, and you you just said this too, so agreeing with you here, that the premise that there is one woman in a world, not one woman, one girl in a world full of men Uh, where there are no other women, um, you could take that in a lot of super fucking bleak directions. And this game really doesn't, to its credit. Uh, Now, the other games, uh, especially the first one, it's not the same premise, but it does take that kind of subject material in a direction that I don't think that I like, and I don't really want to experience that for myself. But this game here, The Painful, really doesn't. Uh, And also... Worth noting, I think I heard that um, the developer doesn't, I mean, doesn't really recommend people play the first game all that much. So take their word for it. I just read a synopsis of it. This game here, uh, I think, toes the line on that particular thing well enough. Uh, And it gets pretty fucking bleak in other areas, for sure. Yeah, as much as I love this game, going back to the idea, it's a qualified recommendation. Um, and this is not going to be to some people's taste, and that's okay. Uh, you you needn't subject yourself to things that upset you if you don't want to. I mean, there there's a time and a place for everything, right? You know, discomfort challenges us to grow. But sometimes you have to protect yourself first. So as much as I adore this game, I would never, you know, if somebody said, look, I just, that's just a little too bleak for me. It's too, too dark. I, that'll mess me up. Okay. Like that's, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, uh, so this is a black comedy and you said in your elevator pitch that it is extreme on like all of those aspects. And I totally agree with you too. Uh, it is super dark and it's also very funny. So It does a good job, in my opinion, of uh, having both, which, you know, a lot of darker comedies will be like kind of dark, but also or like really funny, you know, not weighing down both sides of the scale. That's not how scales work. (laughs) Not, uh, (laughs) you know, tons of weight on each side of the scale, but but they seem to balance each other out. This uh, is super dark, super funny. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the serious things first, then we'll talk about this game's sense of humor. Um, I mentioned that this game uh, takes that last woman on earth theme and does not go in like all of the directions that it could to its credit. There are a lot of other things that it does go really heavy into. Uh, Very prominent uses or allusions to uh, addiction, tons of gore, sexual assault, 
child abuse, suicide, all of those things. So right now, just saying, if you don't uh, want to hear discussions about those things, uh, don't listen to the spoiler section of this episode and don't play this game. Just uh, straight up, if those are things that you don't want in your game or your media, do not play this game because it will it goes really heavy into those. Now, for me personally, like I am okay with media depicting these things. Um, and I think that this game does some interesting things with those things. Uh, but it's a pretty mixed bag, in my opinion. There are some aspects of it that I don't like the depiction. I don't like the uh, jokes maybe that are surrounding it, or I just don't like how the game is handling that. But it's not like, you know, picky and choosing. It's not like I like the uh, all of the addiction content in the game, and I don't like the child abuse stuff. It's a really mixed bag of how they handle it, even within the same type of content, I think. Uh, like, this is a really dark premise for a story. And you said earlier, Rick, the game doesn't pull any punches, and it does not. Uh, so it's it's kind of realistic in some ways about how people might act in like the, the Mad Max uh, apocalypse. I just, uh, I, I think that some things are ha- handled with respect that they should be handled with. And there were some times when I was like, that's a really childish way of presenting this thing. Uh, but it's a really mixed bag, even within the same types of subjects. Okay, that's, I think that's fair. I would be interested to hear as we move forward, what you felt was maybe a bit too childish or a bit too distasteful. I think something to keep in mind, especially if you're teetering on whether or not you would like to play this game is, and I mean, I, I don't know that this merits saying anymore, but you never know. Depiction does not equal endorsement, right? Not everything awful depicted here is an endorsement and it's not depicted in that way. I mean, if that were the case, I don't think either of us would really be into this game, right? It's not, (laughs) we're not into it for like the torture porn or, you know, for, for any hateful reasons. It, it uses everything to an effect, whether or not that effect works for you comes down to, I think, personal taste. And, you know, like we've (laughs) said like five times now, that's, that's fine. You know, Mm -hmm. It, it will also depend on like, maybe some background with things like this. And uh, thankfully, I don't have a lot of like personal experiences to connect with the things that are going on in the game. So I'm more, I guess, open to seeing what the what the game or how the game is going to present these things. Um, and we'll definitely dig into that in the spoiler section. Uh, that's there's there's a lot to talk about with uh, with where this game goes sometimes. Uh, so talking about that serious content and now shifting over to the comedic side of the game, where I think this is legitimately one of the funniest games I've ever played while also going into all of those deep, dark corners of, uh, of humanity. Um, I don't remember the last time a game made me laugh this much, maybe since uh, like playing West of Loathing or something like that. Very, very funny. It really is. But where West of Loathing is more uh, irreverent and silly, sort of like uh, yeah. I, closer to Monty Python on the spectrum. This is, it's very clever and <laughs> it's it, it's absurd, but I, would, I don't know that I would call it irreverent. It does get irreverent, I suppose, but it doesn't have the silliness that West of Loathing and Python have. Uh, like, for example, one of my favorite uh, comedy bits in this game is you stumble into a place that is full of men who love their hair. They oh, yeah. love their hair. They're very <laughs> proud of it. And you walk up to them and the three leaders, they're like, oh, well, hey there, fella. Hi, it's nice to see you. Oh, uh, we know why you're here. Well, we'll just let you on back here. We're all ha-. And then they notice that you're bald and they just stop. And they're like, <laughs> bald? You come into our club with no hair? You dandy fuck? And then <laughs> a boss battle immediately ensues where the three of them have merged into a hair monster that is giving yep. you the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, if you light them on fire, their hair disappears and they're significantly weaker as a boss fight. I, I thought that it's it's a great bit right there. And that's the one that I was thinking about highlighting too uh, in here just to showcase like this game's sense of humor. Uh, also in that scene, there is a drawing of a butt on the wall below these guys. And there's a person just with their nose stuck up in the drawing of a butt. Uh, so yeah, he's really up in there. 
Yeah, kind of that uh, irreverent sense of humor there. Uh, but it's really funny. It's really well written. Um, I think that Jorgensen has a real knack for names. The names, every character's name. There's a bunch of gangs in here. Uh, the gang names, all of those are so creative and funny. Every time I met a new gang, I wanted to know what they're called. Oh, you're called the Schoolboy Shufflers? Oh, that's cool. You guys are called the Banana Splits with a Z? That's awesome. Like, every time. I love it. Yeah, and and the character names, too. I mean, there are some sillier ones, like uh, Tommy Dinkle, <laughs> or like P. <laughs> Dinkle, which are, I actually, I think those are in the Joyful, but uh, things like that. And then you, you've got party names like Crisp Ladaddy, and, uh, <laughs> you know... <laughs> It's it's really good, Bo Wyatt, and uh, it's yeah he's he's got a real knack for for language. Not not in the same way that like you know another game that I resonated with in a very similar way to this. Uh, if that tells you anything, is Disco Elysium. Mm -hmm. Many of uh, very similar themes. Uh, it's he doesn't have a knack for language in the same way. It's it's more so like the sound of language rather than the cadence and the the florid writing it's just you know sticky and rick like those are your <laughs> childhood best friends crisp la daddy and uh spaghetti and cheese legs the dog he, he just he's good with words that sound funny yep yeah i was gonna say if you need a one-liner or you need someone to give someone a funny name uh this is this is the person you should you should hit them up um and then Situations that you find yourself in are often uh, absurd, funny, uh, thinking about like there's a, a place with a, a fast food restaurant that I thought was just fantastically funny. The music too, like plays into the sense of humor. We'll talk about the music in a little bit, but just want to give it a, a little tease here at the beginning. And then uh, your party members that you pick up can often be really funny if you get a chance to sit and talk with them. So I'll give an early shout out to Nern, who is uh, one of my favorite characters in here for just being very funny every time he talks. Yeah, Nern is a, a big favorite of mine. Uh, a big favorite in this recent playthrough was Harvey Alabaster, who uh -huh. is uh, a fish lawyer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. He's a fish lawyer that is able to do debuffs via legal briefings i suppose and wields a machine gun <laughs> oh man and now you remind me of the scene where you meet harvey and uh how funny that scene was so uh i i don't know like i assume you agree with me here that this game like handles that that yo-yo between super funny and super bleak like pretty well it's really remarkable it knows exactly when to take itself seriously and when not to you know, you get towards the end, there's this whole ending sequence where it's quite serious and things are mm -hmm. really ramping up. There's no, there's really no humor to be found. Uh, but, you know, sandwiching between some of these really difficult choices and grim moments, you'll just, I don't know, you'll run into somebody that's just standing by a cliff and you'll talk to them. And all they have to say is, holla holla, if you hear me, <laughs> really needed to get that off my chest. And then they just die. <laughs> just it's 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 crazy yeah it, it's really good um and one more thing to mention about the story uh, i'm glad you mentioned choices there in that bit uh, because that's part of what you're doing here uh this is an rpg i wouldn't call it a choice based rpg but you will find yourself with choices to make throughout the game uh, that have very serious consequences here so i just wanted to shout out what kind of rpg this is uh, you are playing as Brad, not yourself. You can choose choices for Brad, but this is not a branching paths type of story. Uh, this game has a particular story to tell. Um, there are are there multiple endings in this game? I know there are in the the Joyful. There, uh, the ending is going to be the same. You can get different epilogues depending epilogues, on what you do. Yeah. Okay, right. So. The story that you're going to play through here is going to be the same regardless of choices that you make, but you do have choices to make throughout the game that will affect uh, your experience, we'll say. Uh, and some of them are quite shocking, but yet also funny now that I think about, you know, <laughs> what happens later in the game if you choose to to sacrifice something of yourself. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into the spoiler <laughs> section and talking about some of these. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the story and the two tones that the game takes. Let us listen to some music. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, visuals and we'll talk about that soundtrack. <laughs> So first of all, talking about how this game looks, it's a side-scrolling uh, pixel art RPG. It was made in, I can't remember what it was made in, Game Maker or RPG Maker, one of those. So it, it has that look to it. Uh, and I think that the pixel art is really, really um, expressive here. It plays into the comedy. Uh, no two characters seem to look alike in this game. You can tell that a lot of detail went into designing these people and uh, some of the places that you go to. I, I really like how this game looks. Yeah, he's really working well within, I think it's RPG Maker. He's really wor working well within the constraints of that system. And, you know, it's it's not supposed to be a, a super pretty game, but the, the pixelated and uh, the limitations really give it some life in certain scenarios, like how player character, or not player characters, how NPCs will move, they you know, they'll shift by like one pixel and it makes things really, really subtle in a way that you wouldn't expect in something like this. And you're exactly right. It's it's very expressive, almost shockingly so. Yeah. Just how like, again, there seem to be no reused character uh, sprites throughout the entire game. Um, people are really memorable. So if you need to go find somebody again, you kind of remember who they are and maybe where they are. Uh Everyone has their nipples showing, no matter what they're wearing in this game, which I thought was a nice comedy touch. Always made me laugh. I go into a room like, yep, all of them too. Just got the ponchos, no undershirt, nothing like that. <laughs> ponchos that rise up like to their upper chest and that's all. <laughs> yeah, wild fashion sense in this game. Off yep. the charts. <laughs> uh, so it's. It, I don't have a whole lot to say about it visually other than um, it's expressive and it helps make a lot of the characters memorable. Um, the environments that you're in are, are kind of samey looking, but it's you're progressing through a linear path, so it's not like you're going to really get lost. Uh, a semi-linear path, but you move from key hub area to key hub area, so it's not like you're going to be like, oh, I, I don't know if I'm in area one or three right now. It's not like that. So I forgive it for having these things look kind of samey. What's not samey is the soundtrack. Let's talk about the soundtrack. And I'm glad you're here, Rick, uh, because maybe you can help me put words to some of the feelings I have about the soundtrack here. The first thing I want to shout out is that if you take one look at this game and you see how relatively, you know, air quotes, simple it looks, you might assume that the soundtrack is the same and it's not. Uh, there are 97 tracks on the YouTube playlist. And if someone told me, that this game uses every known instrument in the world, I would believe it for a second. And then I'd be like, ah, that's a lot of instruments. What do you mean? But that should give you an idea of how diverse this soundtrack is. It's a, uh, and it was composed by Jorgensen as well. So, yeah. and I, to my knowledge, I don't think he's like a trained musician or anything. I just, you know, he knows what he's listening for. He knows what he likes. What I what I appreciate about the soundtrack is it is so reflective of the world that we're in. You know, we're not going to mm -hmm. be hearing you know, like string quartets and I don't know, <laughs> Ro Leonard Skinner in this. <laughs> Although I, there probably are some, like there's tons of wrestling references in this game to like yeah. real world wrestlers. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like classic rock references that I missed, but mm -hmm. the the music is so crude and rude and nasty. It, it's, it, it's kind of perpetually like wiggling its fingers at you or like biting its thumb at you and, you know, farting while it does it. <laughs> but, you know, that that makes it sound like it's juvenile, but it, it's not. It's it's well constructed. It, it's a really, really, really good soundtrack, even when it's purposefully being discordant. Yeah, there's a lot of intentionally off putting music and especially in like 
ambient tracks. There's a lot of songs in here that have actual, you know, catchy hooks and things like that to them. Uh, there's a lot of ambient background tracks too, and a lot of those are kind of uncomfortable. That fits in with the world of the game, though the game is uh, set in a very uncomfortable place. What kind of stands out to me are when the game has these really pleasant sounding songs like uh, like Summer Love, which is one of the first songs you'll hear. And it's just this very pleasant, you know, slow melody, um, really enjoyable to just sit and listen to. Uh, and then there's a couple other songs I wanted to shout out for being, uh, how do I want to word this? Before you go on, Dave, what I love about Summer Love, yeah, uh, it's it's a really wonderful track. Uh, it's kind of like the song of the track, like the theme song, if you could call mm-hmm. any of them one. Just a really nice mellow trombone, you know, it's it's vibey. Uh, but there are interjection, interjections of just these noticeably louder drum kit fills in between yep. the trombones. You know, you've got the... And it's like, holy moly, where did that come from? And that's like, one, that's kind of setting you up for what this game is going to be, right? You, Your expectations can never be too set. And two, it's like... It's just so comical to hear that. It comes out of nowhere. Uh, you know right off the bat, this game is going to be pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of funny, the uh, the other songs that I wanted to shout out is uh, songs that are extremely fucking catchy when they have no right to be catchy with what they're you know constructed from. So maybe the most famous song from the soundtrack other than Summer Love would be Work Harder. which takes a voice sample of a dude grunting in Shenmue 2 and sets it to a beat, and it becomes legitimately one of the catchiest songs I've ever heard. I have spent the last six months walking around my house doing the grunt to the beat of the song uh, to the point where my wife finally gave in and she started doing it too, just so she would not go crazy (laughs) or something like that. Um, That song is fucking ridiculous. I'm going to make sure I put that song in before this section so that people know what we're talking about here. Uh, But I I don't know. I would. What do you what do you have to say about work harder? Because it's it's insane. Oh, it's hilarious. This is it. And it's tucked away in one uh, room. Well, it's like uh, maybe it's like one big room of the game. You could miss it. And it's just a bunch of dudes that are just like working out. They're bench pressing dressers. (laughs) <laughs> and car tires and cars <laughs> doing squats uh, with like, I think the full title of the song is work harder, not smarter. And they're just talking about like muscle freedom jacked. Let's go power. And it, <laughs> <laughs> it's like this just like the outside has gone so off the rails. The the masculinity has gripped them such that it's become extremely toxic and, and hostile. And in here they're just, they, they're just being dudes. They're just working out. Um, just. <laughs> one, one hilarious thing about this song is in the definitive edition, it kind of got neutered a little bit because they couldn't get the rights to Shenmue at this point. The, right. You know, I, I'm pretty sure it was a rights issue anyway. So Jorgensen called up the voice actor or got into contact with him somehow, explained the situation, and Doolin's voice actor re-recorded a grunt And that's in the definitive edition. Now, it's like he's much older at this point, so it's much like weaker. It doesn't have the vigor behind it. (laughs) So it's it's a bit of a bummer. But how cool. Like, yeah, he's like, oh, the rights are expired. All right. I'll just sidestep the whole company. Yep. Yeah. I'll just get this guy to re-record it. What, 20, 20 years later or however long it's been since Shenmue 2 came out. Yeah, that's it's good. I, I love that story. And I love that he was able to salvage that song because it is. It like when you walk th- through the. I knew about this song before I played the game. I had listened to it hundreds of times before I started playing, but I still didn't know when it was going to come up. So you walk through the door and the the uh, starts going, and I'm like, "Oh shit, there it is!" <laughs> and I can only imagine someone who's not already familiar going in there, and be like, "What is this place? What is this game?" 
it's it's spectacular and there are so many moments like that within this soundtrack um he also makes a lot of use of reusing different tracks at different speeds yep S- extremely slowed down a little bit slowed down a little bit sped up um maybe even backwards at some point i'm not really sure and i i don't know if you know this but the trumpet theme that you know it's it's constantly in in various uh stages of being sped up and slowed down the da 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 that's technically that's diegetic that's being played right. in the world right i and did hear that I, I i didn't know it when i was playing but i did hear that after the fact yeah i didn't know it until this past playthrough and it it kind of blew my mind it, it's i mean i don't know how i feel about the explanation but that's pretty cool, you know, because you hear it constantly and yeah. there's, I mean, there's a reason for it. How about yeah. that? That's wild. Yeah, it's super cool. And I did want to shout out just how often that theme gets reused and other melodies get reused uh, and varied throughout different situations too. But that one, like it rivals like Final Fantasy for reuse of themes and variation like throughout the game. It's kind of crazy how often they do it and how how many different tones that one melody can take. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm trying to think. There's maybe one track in the entire game I'm not really a big fan of, and that would be the Fisherman's Village. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just or I, I excuse me, the Fishmen Village. Right. Uh it, it's just a bit much, but you know, I most players probably won't even see that area unless they're using a guide. Yeah, one other song I wanted to uh, shout out because I I love this song too, and it's it's kind of an example of another thing the soundtrack does that I really like is there's a song called "The Highway King" that also uses vocals in a really uh, different way. The Highway King is using like this super digitized voice that's uh, like not smoothly jumping between notes; it's very like abruptly shifting between uh, pitches, and I but still super catchy, and I really love that. So I wanted to shout that out. And I think that this game does a great job of using uh, vocals in a lot of songs or sounds that are filling the role of vocals, maybe. I don't know if they're actually voices that are super digitized or not, but uh, it's weird and it's off-putting, but it's super catchy, which I think is emblematic of a lot of the music. Yeah, Highway King and uh, I Am Satan are both tied for two of my favorite tracks in the game, and they both use vocal samples in a different way Mm -hmm. highway king to me sounds like it uses the same synth patches as the rugrats like that kind of like it's 90 percent somebody just going bah 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 and then there's like 10 percent of like a belch quality (laughs) to it you know what i mean (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. it it just i don't know any as soon as i heard it i I was just taken back to you know tommy pickles (laughs) ah second time today i've had the rugrats brought up in different situations uh oh for real maybe that's a sign yeah my dog's uh bed is really sunken in and it reminds me of stew pickles's bed in that show where it's just like an <laughs> outline of his body in a t-pose <laughs> <laughs> well he has lost control of his life that's right he has yeah uh much <laughs> like everybody in this game So in Lisa the Painful, let's start with what it's like to just move around and explore in the world uh, to just set what your exploration is going to be like. It's from a side-scrolling view, which is not usual for RPGs like this. Uh, And from a side-scrolling view, you are introduced to a little bit of platforming. Uh, Brad can't jump, but there are a lot of ledges to drop from, ropes to climb, Uh, You get a bicycle at some point that helps you get over little gaps in ledges. Uh, There's fall damage. There's instant death if you fall too far or fall off of uh, an edge into a, you know, a bottomless pit or something like that. So a lot of areas, there is this kind of like traversal element trying to figure out, okay, I see a treasure up there. How am I going to get to that thing? Or there's a door. How am I going to get there? How am I going to get down to this place without dying? Stuff like that. Uh, so what did you think about like the 
the act of exploring the world and doing this kind of light platforming here. The platforming itself, you know, I don't mind it. It's slow. It's methodical. Um, or maybe methodical is not the right word. Maybe it's just slow. I'm fine with that. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't looking for like a heavy platforming challenge here. Uh, you'll appreciate this. Actually, I, I thought of this on the way home today. This game, like the platforming itself and how sometimes it can feel directly antagonistic of you reminds me of Dark Souls a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I I haven't played Dark Souls more than probably a combined total of two hours across all three games. Uh, I, I am continuing to try. That's another conversation, though. But like every clip I see of it is like somebody trying to like, you know, get away from a boulder or an enemy in a very specific way but the boulder will just graze them a little bit and knock them off into a chasm and they die. And that's hilarious to me. Oh yeah. Uh, (laughs) And like the same thing will happen here. You'll just be walking. You'll go, uh, since this game progresses screen by screen, you know, you have to reach the end of the right side of the screen and then you immediately spawn on the left side of the next screen. You'll be walking and all of a sudden the next screen is just a cliff and you just (laughs) fall off (laughs) and it says game over. That's really funny to me. (laughs) Some of it is funny. And like, um, I'm glad you recognize the humor in Dark Souls because there's a ton of it there. And a lot of that same thing is there. I agree with you that like I see an item down there. If I just jump the way it is right now, I'll probably die. So I got to figure out how to get down there. There is that kind of figuring out how to get from place to place for sure. Uh, one thing that helps is that your movement on this game is like kind of tile based. So if you press, if you just press the D-pad once in a direction, you'll shift over one space instead of like incrementally or smoothly moving across it, we'll say. So if you're just going willy nilly, especially when you're on the bike, you can just ride off the edge of a cliff and die, especially because this game likes to put ladders on that last space right before a cliff. Uh, But if you're just careful about it, you'll be fine for most of these. Anytime it happened to me, I was like, yeah, I was just kind of holding it, not really paying attention. You develop a feel eventually of like when to let go based on like how many more tiles you need to move. You mentioned the bike and, um, you know, we, we didn't get to the tutorial of this game, but this game has a bit of a tongue in cheek way of tutorializing things. But when it wants to show you how to do something, I can think of two specific examples. It does it really well. The bike is a good example. So when you get the bike, Um, You have to fight something to get to the bike, and then the bike is up on top of this platform. Once you get to it, you can't jump down because there's an object like a a piece of trash that's just in your way. So you have to go to the right to go to the next screen. And when you get to the next screen, immediately you drop off of a ledge. But you don't fall to your death. You hop across the gap, which you cannot do if you're on foot. So that is the game's way of teaching you like, hey – you are going to need to do this here. Like, let us show you in a very safe way that this is how this game is going to handle traversal. And I think that's really cool. Um, Now, like you said, there are also a lot of like (laughs) uh, ladders and ropes that are at the very edge of the, of of cliffs. And if you fall, well, oopsie daisy, but yeah, I I don't know. I really appreciated that. Yeah. I appreciated the, uh, the teaching the game does too. And again, I didn't really mind Anytime I fell off to my death, it was usually my fault. Uh, Or it was like a, hey, I wonder how much fall damage I take if I jump down here to this place way below. Oh, it killed me? Well, that was my fault for jumping that far. You know, I I didn't feel like this was unfair in the slightest, really. So, uh, and I, I like when games have a little bit of a puzzle to get to a treasure that they show you in plain sight. And this game does that a lot. So I enjoyed that. You'll get into combat pretty often in here. And it's worth noting, uh, it is an RPG that looks like RPGs that have random encounters, but this game only has a few sections that have random encounters. The rest of the time, you can see people. Uh, There are some ambushes, but a lot of times you can see people before you fight them. So you can at least know you're going to fight a lot of the times. When you get into combat, it is turn-based, but instead of being like the... um, you know, the Final Fantasy method of turn-based or something like that. In this game, everybody queues up their moves all at the same time, and then you click execute, and then everybody, your team and the enemies, all attack in the order of their uh, their speed or their agility, 
whatever the stat is that governs it. Um, I thought this was cool to give you a little bit of extra strategy about what commands you assign to what character. And um, yeah, this, uh, this, this combat system has a lot more to it than I expected going into it, which I, I was a nice, pleasant surprise for me. Oh, yeah, 100%. If you are somebody that uh, tends to feel that JRPGs uh, become mash X to attack simulators, then this is going to be something that scratches your itch for you. You have to, like you said, this plays out like true turn-based where everybody inputs their actions and then they go based on uh, speed or agility. So you have to plan then. You don't get the luxury of saying like, well, Yuna goes next and then waka after her and then the enemy so i have time to heal and attack you you have to be preemptive and proactive about it uh which you're going to want to do anyway because this game places such a massive emphasis on buffs and debuffs which Mm -hmm. again that's another big complaint that people hear a lot about jrpgs uh and it's funny there was actually a conversation going on in moon server a friend of the show moon And I I don't know if she was participating or not, but somebody (laughs) somebody was talking about how they didn't like Jorgensen because he made a JRPG, even though he is a self-proclaimed disliker of the genre. And I was like, you know, as somebody that loves the genre, he made a damn good one, even if he doesn't like it. (laughs) And uh, I I think that's I mean, that's part of it, too. Right. I mean, a lot of Final Fantasy games become. At a certain point, you just attack, attack, attack. Even if you get paralyzed, attack, attack, attack. Poisoned, attack, attack, attack. Silenced, attack, attack, attack. Here, you can't do that. Like, here, if you are drunk, if you are blinded, if you're pissed, if you're, you know, wary, uh, whatever hilarious status effect you have, that really, really matters. And you can't just ignore it or you very likely will die. Yeah, the game places a huge emphasis on status effects both from your side and on the enemy's side i'm looking at the wiki right now and there's got to be like 50 status effects here there's a just an insane amount of things that can go uh, wrong for you and for the enemies so i am one of those people who like even in some of my favorite games one of the things that sucks is that you're supposed to get excited about learning a new skill that might be a debuff on the enemies or a status effect, but you know when it's, you know, a really tough enemy or a boss fight, the final boss, etc. You're not going to be able to use those things on them. So what's the point? Uh, you can only use them on the enemies you don't need them for. And Lisa the Painful is not like that. Uh, you can use most of these on most characters. They all have their own resistances and things like that. But there's a, a secret like mega boss that I fought in here and I was able to use status effects on them and I would not have won straight up without using those status effects. So uh, shout out to the emphasis. It's a, it's a nice anecdote that the, uh, the developer is a, someone who doesn't like the, uh, the genre because it seems like they fixed a lot of the things they probably don't like about uh, some of the other games here. So uh, it's it's it ends up being a super strategic combat system, uh, and that is also important because it's a tough combat system. You really have to be on, like, with your skills, your status effects. Because I don't know if like the average enemy is probably not going to party wipe you, but you can get some nasty status effects from them. They might kill a character. Uh, items, especially ones that like revive characters and healing items, are pretty scarce. So you really got to be on top of things. And if you get hurt too badly, the only way to reliably heal up the whole party is to rest. And a lot of the places you can rest are very unsafe to do so. So it all goes back to being very mindful about what you do in combat. And I love that. I love it so much. Exactly. So this is a game of balancing risk and reward. Even if those uh, random encounters or those guys that ambush you, which like going back to the Dark Souls thing, like the humor of Dark Souls, you'll see an item, you'll walk two steps to pick it up, and a guy wearing literally nothing but a football helmet will just dive bomb you. Yep. <laughs> Suddenly you're in a fight. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's he might not wipe your whole party, but if he KOs one of your guys, suddenly 
you've got one man down and what are you going to do? Like resources in this game are not plentiful. This is not a game of, of collect and hoard the gill and elixirs. You can't do that. Um, and to your point, Dave, he fixed Jorgensen fixed a lot of the things about JRPGs that maybe give it, give them a, in my opinion, unfair reputation of being kind of mindless once you get, you know, halfway through the game. You can't do that here. You always have to be weighing what is the risk versus reward. Should I rest here? Yes, no. Should I use my last revive item if I don't know what's coming up? Yeah, it might be more random battles. It might be a boss. I don't know. And I mean, that's great. I'm with you. I I love it. I love that it's asking me to be really considerate and careful. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And one of the other things that makes you be really considerate and careful about basically everything you do is uh, this game has a lot of, I'm going to phrase it as antagonistic mechanics towards somebody who wants an easy ride. Uh, There are risks associated with certain things that you do. And then there are some things that are just straight up like a a fuck you to the player from time to time. Some of these things just to go through them quickly and then get our thoughts. Uh, I mentioned in the story section that Brad is an addict. There's a a drug called joy that he's addicted to. There are other characters that are joy addicts and if you don't give them joy, they'll go through withdrawals and withdrawals will really, it's like a super debuff on the character, uh, it reduces their stats and it makes it so that they can't do some of their moves in combat. Uh, you can remove that by giving them joy, uh, which is actually a massive buff, but there is a story reason why you may not want to do that. So there's that, Uh, There is the instant death falls we talked about before. This is not a game where you can save anywhere. There are set save points. So if it's been, you know, 10 minutes since you saved and you fall to your death, you got to start back from that time you saved. There are moves that enemies can do, not all enemies, but like bosses can do, and story events that will permanently kill characters. This is a game that has permadeath in it. Now, it can't happen to Brad but it can happen to your other party members. So I don't know. It, it, this is something that I think is pretty divisive out there. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on the permakill stuff, but also maybe like the joy addiction mechanic too. Okay. So it's, it's a lot to break down. I think yeah. my global feelings about it is this. If they, if Jorgensen created this such that it wasn't this antagonistic and hostile towards you, it would be thematically bereft. It why so Brad is a middle aged alcoholic who is also addicted to joy. Why would he not get withdrawals? Why would he not, or why would he be in f- physical peak form? Right, the whole area is extremely hostile. Why would you be safe sleeping outside every single time? It doesn't make a lick of sense. Um, the, there is one moment in the game, literally one that I think is an objective fuck you to the player that (laughs) I, I, I like it, but I also hate it. (laughs) I think Um, I like it because I got lucky. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the one area where I'm like, yeah, dude, like save scum, like just do it. It's fine. But I, you know, the insta death, uh, permadeath was something where at first I was really, not feeling, but they give you upwards of 30 recruitable characters. Mm-hmm. So you're never, it, it would be astonishingly unlucky if you lost so many people that you were just like really boned by the end. Yeah, I agree with you basically on all fronts there. This game can seem like it wants you to fail, but th- there are things that offset it. Like you said, like you might have characters get perma killed, but you'll pick up like three more characters in the next town. Like if you're exploring around, well, we'll say, but you get enough characters to offset that. Uh, If you're someone who doesn't want anyone to die uh, and you reset in Fire Emblem when somebody dies, then yeah, you're not going to like it because it's probably going to happen. But I don't know. I think that it does reinforce the setting of the game in a way that is additive to it all. Kind of like you said, it's a dangerous place. Bad things happen to basically everybody why would everything be perfectly fine for Brad and the traveling party 
just because you're, you know, your video game protagonist or something like that. Uh, sleeping outside is something that uh, you mentioned. I, I mentioned earlier that you can rest to regain your health. The only safe place to do that is in uh, very infrequent inns uh, or some other places you might unlock. A lot of times you'll find campfires, though, and you're free to sleep there, but something bad might happen in the night. Uh, Someone might rob your stuff. Someone might kidnap one of your party members. One of your party members might just leave. They might say, okay, well, uh, you know, we've had our fun. I'm out. And they're gone. So it's discouraging you from doing something that wouldn't make sense for the characters to be doing in a way that I thought helped the story. And we'll talk about it in the spoiler section, but some of these other things that happen that might seem player antagonistic reinforce Brad's story and the story of everybody else in the world too. So I'm with you. I think this is good, uh, even if it doesn't feel good when a character gets perma-killed. Dave, you left off the worst thing that can happen to you when you rest at a campfire. Nern might talk to you? (laughs) No, no, no. That's one of the best things. (laughs) Okay. No, Dave, the worst thing that can happen to you, man, in the middle of the night, right as you're waking up, some guy is standing over you, cheeks to cheeks, if you will, and lets out a big fat fart on your face. Oh, that never happened to me. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, dude, you wake up and there's just a dude that's standing over you and you just hear like a little poot. And then he just runs away. You, nothing bad happens at all. It's just, <laughs> it's just one of those like really silly things. <laughs> that is one time I woke up from resting and a guy with a baseball bat just hit Brad in the face and he lost permanent stat points because of that. So that was fun. <laughs> but it's funny. That's Both so, of us laugh when we say that. So yeah, it, even, I mean, the game expects you to lose stat points. So like you're you're going to be fine. It's not a game of big numbers. I think the max level is like 25, you know, yeah. and you will be lo- like if you're joyed out of your mind, you'll be lucky to be hitting 2000 damage. So it's not it's not a game of like humongo bungo numbers. Yep. And uh I made some story choices also that like permanently debuffed my character in a huge way and I still had like relatively little trouble getting through the game like it's a game of strategy in combat and making wise use of your skills rather than like you said leveling up and getting higher numbers we should say though you can do that if you want like this game you're not intended to grind because there are very few random encounters but there is like uh there's a this is not really a spoiler there's because it's not story related but there's a wrestling ring that you can join Mm -hmm. And if you fight in there, you can get experience. And if you lose, you don't get a game over. It's, it's perfectly safe. You all, all you have to lose is time and I guess dignity, (laughs) but I mean, you can, if you want to just level up until everybody's max level and breeze through the game. But I mean, that's, uh, that's, I don't think that's fun to do in any JRPG personally. No, I, I don't do that either. And, um, I think that that wrestling ring is there Because you get so many characters, you might need to train them up a little bit before they're ready for the big time. So they he gives you a chance to do that. Because you're right, like there's, I don't know, maybe three places that have random encounters in the whole game. So and it's a fun, you know, narrative way to do that, we'll say, uh, because there's an obvious love for wrestling and martial arts throughout the entire game. So they're just going to put a whole ass wrestling place in there. Yeah, Jorgensen is big into martial arts. He's a, like, if you YouTube Austin Jorgensen, I think one of the first things that comes up is him at a martial arts tournament performing. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, there's, like, Macho Man is in here. Hulk Hogan is in here. Uh, Ric Flair, I'm pretty sure, is in here. Uh, various <laughs> other respected martial arts, like the Power Rangers. Right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, from a gameplay perspective, I was, like very, very satisfied by this game uh, from a tactic standpoint, from a, a difficulty standpoint, and then from a way that this gameplay ties into the story in lots of other ways that we didn't mention. But it, it I think it all combines into a, a full product devoted to its setting in a way that is is really good. So I'm I'm happy with this. Yeah, it's it's really terrific. It's mechanically crunchy. Um, way more than you would expect if you just watch like Dunkey's video or just see some of the funny moments. It's, it's really satisfying. Uh, And with 30 party members or so you can make builds, even if you're losing, losing guys, it's, Mm -hmm. it's really rewarding. 
Yep. Would you say that for anyone listening who might be kind of curious, would you say that most of those 30 party members that you can get, because I assume you've seen and used way more of them than I did, would you say that they're all be- pretty much viable? Uh, that's that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I mean, you have to take into consideration a non-negligible number of them are joy ad- addicts. So right. you would need to keep up with that, whether you want to... Uh, joy withdrawal will go away after a certain number of moves in combat. The problem is, is if you do a regular attack in combat while withdrawal withdrawn, you do zero damage. So you you have to resort to using your specials, which takes away SP or TP. Uh, and even then they're going to be reduced. So I, I think it's like 20 moves in battle or something, or yeah. you could take, take a chance at resting in a campfire or something. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. And some characters, to be honest, kind of just aren't as useful as the rest. I mean, that's something to keep in mind, too, I suppose. But, I mean, again, 30, 30 or so dudes, you're you're going to be okay. You just reminded me of something that I forgot to, uh, to even mention, and that there's uh, two kinds of, like, magic points or skill points in this game. And one of them is the traditional, like, the character has you know, 500 magic points. And if you use skills that decreases until you heal them until they run out. Uh, There's another type though, where a character will start with a set number every combat and you can increase it by using skills or in some cases like giving them alcohol or something like that. Uh, And then it will (laughs) decrease as they use skills. It will also increase if you just do regular attacks. And I thought this was a nice system too, to always be like, managing that uh that resource for them to use their good attacks and i used two characters that worked on this system um, and i had a really good time with it the tp system yeah yeah and it's it's cool too because alcohol in this game serves as both a buff and debuff you know when you're drunk you have a higher crit rate uh but i think your accuracy is lower um i actually don't think it's as big of a buff as maybe it maybe it's meant meant to be Mm -hmm. but you also will get hung over afterwards too which is its own downside uh the nice thing about tp is it resets i and i'm sorry if you mentioned this it resets back to base level after every single match Mm -hmm. so if you hoard it it's going to go back to to normal if you uh use it all it's going to go back to normal it's uh you know it's very profound dave everything (laughs) returns to to normalcy that's right it's a message everything's a message man (laughs) All right. So uh, the message that I will give is that I would like to listen to (laughs) music uh, one more time. We'll come back. We'll do our wrap up thoughts and then we will get into that spoiler section soon enough. Okay, so to kick off this uh, kind of wrap-up section here, we answer the question that we always do. Uh, it's obvious, Rick, that you, overall, you have a qualified recommendation for Lisa the Painful, but what kind of person, gamer, if you will, uh, would this game appeal to, do you think? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to know about the subject matter before going in. Yeah. That's just, I, I don't think that will do any good to be shocked by that. However, if that is something that you can digest, this is for for folks who like turn-based combat, who like strategy combat, maybe who are a little disenchanted with the JRPGs that are just mac- mash X to attack. Uh, if you like Earthbound, you're probably going to like this. Yeah, I said in the elevator pitch that this is Earthbound's evil twin or evil... Uh, grandson or something like that. And I I think I I stand by that because one of the messages of uh, Earthbound and Mother 3 in that series is uh, one of the themes is like love and togetherness and support and things like that. Uh, And that's not what this game is about. It's about the opposite things. It's about the bleak side of humanity uh, in a lot of cases. So I agree with you that first and foremost, you have to be up for that, you have to be up for the game to explore uh, with, again, no punches pulled, those uh, subjects, suicide, abuse, uh, addiction, things like that. Uh, if you are up for it, then I do think this is a super interesting game. 
Um, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about. We'll get into in the spoiler section with the uh, the premise of again the last woman on Earth and Brad's journey to try and save her. I really enjoyed the process of playing the game, and it's it's super helped by the fact that it is, like you said, a mechanically really crunchy, satisfying game. Which uh, every time I play one of these RPGs like this, that you know, has no business being as deep and strategic as it is, but it is, uh, I kind of lose patience for those that don't try to build it out this way. So uh, I I really like this as a play experience. Again, there's some things in the spoiler section that I'm going to uh, need to bounce around before I like land one direction or another with how it handles some of these things. But that's what these discussions are for. So for now, I'll echo that qualified recommendation that if what we've talked about so far sounds interesting to you, uh, if you want that crunchy combat, and if you want a legitimately very, very funny game, uh, then Lisa the Painful is a good one to check out. So before we get into spoilers, we, uh, as always, will do the plugs. So Rick, I want you to, uh, as is customary, please tell people about Pixel Project Radio, uh, what kind of show it is, and what people can expect, uh, maybe an episode they can start with. Sure. So uh, Pixel Project Radio is not dissimilar to Tales from the Backlog. I would be willing to bet if you like one, whether it's Dave's show or mine, you will probably like the other. I think the biggest difference between the two is I like to do roughly once a month, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, straight up beat by beat plot synopses, Mm -hmm. wherein we go through like we are at an actual book club. Which, by the way, I've never been a part of, and that bums me out. Like, yeah, that sounds a lot. fun. Yeah. <laughs> the The only book club that I was ever invited to is at the worst job I've ever had, and they were reading like Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I was <laughs> like, oh no, thank you. <laughs> but um, anyways, you know, we do something like that once a month to really get into the narrative. Um, I am somebody that really puts story and narrative above most other things in games. The big exception being fighting games, but. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have rotating guests, uh, mainly a similar cast of rotating guests. Dave is a, a regular on the show. If you're looking for something with Dave uh, to check out on my show, we did Near Replicant. We did that in two parts. Uh, that's something that I do a lot on the show, so we don't have to like rush through story. Uh, Near Replicant with Dave. That was a really, really terrific series. If you are looking for something uh, that is more just one and done kind of episode... Night in the Woods is one that I tend to recommend a lot. It is uh, somewhat earlier, but I'm, I'm still really proud of that one. Uh, Celeste, by the time this one comes out, uh, this episode comes out, our episode on Celeste will be out. I thought that was a lot of fun, too. It's one of my favorite games. Uh, and Lisa the Painful. You know, if you like this game, we did an early episode, as Dave mentioned, uh, about an hour ago on Lisa the Painful. And uh, begrudgingly, I re-listened to it. <laughs> And I, I think it, I don't like listening to myself, but I think it holds up. Um, the, the guest, Charlie Young, who's been on this show before is one of, one of my longtime, really, really good friends, uh, so much smarter than me that it, it makes me both sick and inspired (laughs) sometimes, um, which I'm sure he will deny if you ask him, but he's a, he's a great dude. So I, I, uh, yeah, those are great for you to check out if you would like, you can do that basically wherever you get your podcasts, unless you are on the Google podcast train, RIP Google podcasts. That's right. RIP in peace. Yeah. Shout out to Charlie. Charlie's, (laughs) Charlie's incredible. So uh, if you want to listen to more content about Lisa and you want a different guest, a different voice, and uh, probably, you know, a somewhat different conversation, go check out the podcast over on Pixel Project Radio. And I do want to shout out the long multi-part series that you do uh, over there. Uh, specifically Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy IX both got like four or five part series on the podcast, really giving uh, all of the story time to breathe and discussion about, uh, you know, individual moments and things like that, which we don't uh, go through in that fine of detail on this show, especially not like the beat by beat plot breakdown. So uh, I will give a a hearty recommendation for everybody to uh, go check out Pixel Project Radio, as I always do. There's a reason Rick's one of the most uh, common guests on the podcast here (laughs) is because I like what he's doing. So yeah, go check it out. You'll find links to Pixel Project Radio down in the show notes. 
And uh, for this podcast, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Leaving ratings and reviews is really helpful for podcasts. If people search for Lisa the Painful, if you uh, leave a five-star rating, maybe write a review, it will help boost this episode in the algorithm so people can find it. That's what we want. You can listen to my other podcast called A Top 3 Podcast, where we do top three lists. We do drafts. That's a comedy show. I think it's a good time. You can join the Discord server for the podcast. If you played Lisa the Painful and you want to talk about the story uh, with me and with Rick and with lots of other smart people, you can jump in the Discord server. We would love to have you in there. And last but not least, if you want to support monetarily, it's at patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson for a minimum of $2 per month. You can vote in what games I do on the show. You get some bonus episodes and a bunch of other treats. So... With all that being said, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, it's full spoiler time for Lisa the Painful. All right, we're back, and it is full spoiler time for Lisa the Painful. As usual on this uh, podcast, we're not going to just do a chronological run-through of the story, so late game spoilers might be coming soon. So please leave if you don't want to be spoiled for anything about this game. Uh, Also want to reiterate, we're going to talk about maybe some stuff from Lisa the First and Lisa the Joyful. Uh, Even though I didn't play them, it's very relevant to characters and events in this game too. So we might talk about those. And uh, again, please heed the content warnings that I talked about earlier in the episode, uh, talking about sexual abuse, child abuse, addiction, suicide, and things like that. So with that out of the way, um, I wanted to start the spoiler section here because the first half of the game, after Buddy leaves and before you find Buddy, most of what you're doing, there's not a lot of like big strong plot that happens during that section. A lot of what you're doing is meeting characters, gathering up party members, and then uh, some memorable things happen along the way too. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of our favorite characters. So Rick, I'll, I will turn it over to you first. Um, who's a character that you would like to shout out, a party member? Oh man, there are so many. <laughs> um, I, you know, you've got to shout out Terry Hintz, the terror bear. Yep. He is the first one that you meet, uh, and it's where the game sets up its humor. You know, you see him in a tree, and there's just this little tiny little dog, just this, like, it, practically a puppy. And he's like, oh, hey, I, I tore my my uh, H-string getting up this tree <laughs> because this ferocious beast is chasing me. Uh, and that that sort of sets the tone. Terry is also the t- the lord of the tutorial. Uh, Terry Hints is his name. This is what I meant when I when I said they take a cheeky aspect, uh, a cheeky approach, excuse me, to tutorializing. Yeah, a in cheeky that... aspect. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, <laughs> but yeah. Oh no, that was intentional. That's a. <laughs> you don't have to apologize. I'm perfectly gruntled, man. Uh, but <laughs> but Terry will leave all of these hints around, uh, little posters that you can read, and it'll just say like, yeah, don't don't forget to save at crows. You never know. Uh, when you might need someone watching your back. And he signs it off different every time, like Terry Hints, the Terrorster, Terror Bear, Sweet Terry Wine. And it's <laughs> I, that never got old for me personally. Yeah. Uh, Terry, Terry also serves a useful tutorial in that when you first get him, he is awful. He cannot do damage. So you have to rely on his buffs and debuffs. Mm, that is the yeah. game teaching you by, well, by force kind of, that buffs and debuffs are important. So I love Terry Hints. Um, we're going to talk about Nern. Yeah, I'm sure. So Nern is great. Harvey Alabaster, the fish lawyer mm-hmm. is really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beastborn is a party member that I liked using a lot. There's not really much to him, but I think he's pretty cool. Uh, Dick Dixon, who is the <laughs> pink, pink, uh, salvation ranger. Yep. <laughs> he's pretty sweet. And, uh, you know, I think the rest of these we'll probably talk about. So I think that's that's all for me for for shout outs. 
Right on. Yeah. Um, with Terry, Terry also tutorializes that bad things can happen to your characters because uh, you get a, a story moment early in the game where you're asked to sacrifice Terry uh, or I think it's lose your money, maybe. It's lose everything in your inventory. Lose everything. Okay. So I sacrificed Terry at the beginning because I was scared. I was scared by how like seemingly difficult the game was at the beginning. And I was like, I can't lose my money and my three things that I have in my inventory. I need those. So yeah, I sacrificed Terry and uh, he comes back later in the game, right? (laughs) Yes. Uh, And and by the way, like this game makes that a meaningful choice too. like a character's life versus your resources. Yeah, that. That has some weight behind it. Uh, yes, if you sacrifice Terry, he comes back as a member of Rando's army later right. on and you have to fight him. Uh, and he is strong when you fight him again. So if he stays in your party, does he eventually get to be really strong? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got some of the best uh, moves in the game. Nice. I like that. He's a, he's a magic harp. Yeah, he's a late bloomer. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about Nern. Let's, let's not, uh, let's not <laughs> beat around the bush too much. Uh, so... Nern is extremely chatty. He has a lot to say. And I don't I think I mentioned this earlier, but like you can't just like talk to your party members whenever you want. It will only happen in certain moments when you actually get a chance to talk to them. But uh when you first meet Nern, he tells you the longest fucking story ever uh <laughs> about his his sweet wife which then turns into his battle axe of a wife which turns into his like, you know, devil of a wife. And then his, uh, you know, God rest her soul, my 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 late wife. <laughs> and he goes on this story about how she brought potato salad to a to a barbecue yeah. and how he was so embarrassed. And the next words out of his mouth are, "So my dumb potato bitch wife, God rest her soul." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just man, it's it's so it's so good. It's like so deadpan and so ridiculous. I love Nern. Yeah. I really do. That story he tells is a real uh, Abe Simpson. Uh, we put onions on our belt type of story, <laughs> like a, just a meandering story that goes almost nowhere. But then he joins your party. Uh, he kind of like when he's done telling the story, he doesn't join your party right away, but he just kind of like creeps and follows you. And then eventually he's like, all right, I'll join the party. And then he comes, he goes with you. His campfire scene, which by the way, one of only like maybe three or four that I saw campfire scenes, his campfire scene was legitimately one of the funniest moments in the whole game uh, for me because he does it again he goes on this long ass story uh keeps talking about uh, i can't remember exactly what he talks about in the uh the campfire scene but it's a lot of text uh and then after minutes of clicking through this story and brad is like very obviously he like puts his head down like he's maybe not he, he might be even asleep uh, and then Nuren leans down like real close to him. And he's like, I'd appreciate if you respected my time a little bit uh, going forward. And it's just really good. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe, uh, you know, we we mentioned the Retro Hangover uh, server. I can't believe that they uh, so many people hated this moment. I thought it was absolutely hysterical. Yeah, I don't Especially get it. Yeah. when he's <laughs> when he's like, you know. We've been talking a while. I'd appreciate it if you respected my time moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. Uh, like Brad, Brad doesn't really talk a whole lot to uh, to people. He will. But um, during this exchange, it's like 95% Nern. So uh, and then, yeah, that whole like, man, like this is this is taking a long time. Like, really, can, can you just can you keep it short for once? Uh, so I love that. Um, I had Nern in my party the entire game. I ran through basically the whole game with Nern, uh, Olan, and uh, Mad Dog. That's the other one. That was my party for <laughs> after the Russian roulette scene on. That was my party. I uh, I was taking guitar lessons from this really kind of sketchy guy in middle school. Mm-hmm. And uh, he gave me a pair of these like awful sunglasses and started calling me Mad Dog for okay. the rest of the time <laughs> I took lessons from him. <laughs> It was the weirdest thing. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Nern, <laughs> Nern is really serviceable the entire time. Um, you mentioned the campfire scenes. It should be noted that like a lot of them are funny. Like Nern's is straight up just funny. Queen, uh, another character, Queen Rogers, yeah. his is very funny, but also has a lot of heart to it. Yes, it does. Um, 
he he's a great example of how this game handles like uh, sexuality in a great way. But there are ones that are actually sad. Uh, you mentioned Olan. Did you get his campfire scene? I can't remember. So th- he has two. The first one, you know, Olin's an alcoholic. Uh, he is. Yeah. Uh, he has the TP gauge. He just he. You have to buy him a drink to recruit him. He's an alcoholic. And um, during the first campfire scene, Brad gives him joy, and he's like, "Here, try this. You know, <clears throat> this is better than alcohol. It it makes you feel nothing." Uh, because that's what the drug joy does. It makes you feel nothing. Yeah. And Olin tries it. And the next time you talk to him, he's like going on about how like, you know, his wife left him and like his kids left him and his life is a mess. But you don't it doesn't matter because that's all in the past. And there's a moment at the end where you, where he says something to the fact like booze, like I don't even do that much anymore. You turn me on to these, remember? And y- you get him addicted to joy. You mm. active and Something that we didn't mention, and Dave, you can bleep this if you want to reveal it later. Uh, Joy addiction comes at a very deadly cost, mutating you into a monster. Uh, The one of the key monsters in this game. So you have doomed Olin by getting him hooked on this. And the campfire scene ends with like Brad goes to sleep and Olin sheds a tear. And when you wake up, his hat is there. He he leaves you. Oh, okay. And. If you backtrack to the bar where you found him, he's on the roof as a joy mutant. Ooh, shit. Okay, yeah, I definitely didn't get yeah. this. That's why I was like, I don't think so. Yeah, I definitely didn't uh, see this. It's really sad. And th- there can be like um, campfire scenes that don't even involve Brad. Like I got one with Chris Pladaddy, <laughs> Rooster Cox, and somebody else. <laughs> and they were literally just talking about how shitty of a person Brad is. Yeah. And about how he sees all of the party as pawns. He doesn't care. He's a monster. Um, he's going to get what he deserves one day. It's These campfire scenes are only in the definitive edition, and they greatly enhance the character lore and world building. They wow. are so good. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. I didn't know they were just in the definitive edition. They're, yeah, I, I kind of can't imagine putting any sort of relationship between Brad and the characters uh, together without these. These play such a huge role in that. And I was just going to say, even the ones that are funny show you how little Brad thinks of the people in the party. Like, he's never friendly or supportive with anybody, really. Uh, Any warmth or humor or anything is all coming from the other characters. Like, a lot of the times he just lays down and ignores them. Yeah, and I think that comes from the his past. Um, so this is Lisa the First spoilers straight up. Yeah. So skip ahead by like a minute if you don't want to hear it. But the premise of Lisa the Painful, Lisa is, I mean, excuse me, Lisa the First. Lisa is Brad's little sister. They live together with their dad, Marty. Marty was sexually and physically abusive with Lisa. Uh, it drove her to take her own life. Mm-hmm. Brad feels responsible because he was complicit in it. He knew about it, but he didn't, he wasn't able to stop it. So yeah, that is Brad's entire impetus. It is his uh, reason for existence. Uh, he wants to redeem himself. Yeah. And that, that is really important whenever we talk about his relationship with buddy. Right. And uh, I thought, cause there's parts when you go through the game and you will see Lisa. And I thought that was buddy for a long time because they look somewhat similar Um, but there's a lot of times where you see Lisa or maybe many copies of Lisa in, you know, a screen that you go on. And once I kind of read a little bit about that, or maybe asked in discord, I can't remember, probably asked in discord. I don't do a lot of reading, you know, once I figured that out, the story kind of started to make a lot more sense. Uh, cause I knew that Marty abused Brad, but one of the big questions that I, you know, glad we didn't talk about until now is like, okay, we have Brad and Buddy. Who the fuck is Lisa? The game is called Lisa. It's his sister that, yeah, killed herself uh, because of uh, the abuse that she endured in that first game. Yeah, it's it's extraordinarily tragic, and it's referenced all throughout this game mm-hmm. uh, with Buzzo in particular. I know, I know you wanted to talk about him later, uh, so I'll hold off. But Lisa and Buzzo were very much intertwined. Okay, all right, gotcha. Um, so I want to talk about that queen campfire scene and queen as a character and, uh, the way that you meet queen. Cause I thought this was a really good character and, uh, a really nice 
way of uh, this game looking at both um, sex work and masculinity together uh, and, you know, different interactions that you have there. I thought this was really good. Uh, So you meet Queen, Queen runs a brothel. Uh, There's, again, no women in the world, so it's all men dressed as women. Um, But Brad has to work in the brothel. I don't know if you actually have to do this part or not. I did it. Uh, Brad works in the brothel. But a lot of what he has to do is just, you know, people come in and they just need a hug or they just need someone to be nice to them for a short uh, amount of time. And I thought that this was a really, like, soft and in a good way, soft and uh, tender is a better word, handling of like this kind of thing in this world, uh, because so much of the world is this just hyper masculine, you know, like you said, dudes bench pressing dressers, but also dudes doing the most horrific things possible. Uh, And then they go to this place and some of them just need a hug and they need to feel supported and loved for once. Um, And I thought, this part was really, really good. And that's not even talking about the campfire scene with Queen later. Right. This is another example of how this game handles toxic masculinity extremely well, because that's not just about being terrible to women. It's it's how this notion of masculinity prevents men from being healthy to themselves. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know there was a time a couple months ago on Twitter where like male loneliness was being totally lampooned by frankly, bad faith actors on Twitter saying like, you know, oh, it's men, so we don't have to feel bad for them, which is (laughs) ridiculous if you ask me. But, you know, male loneliness has been an issue for a long time. And that's exactly what this is getting in touch with. Like these men don't want to clap cheeks, you know, and they don't want to explore their basis desires. They just want to feel seen and feel comforted. And that that goes into the campfire scene 100 uh, percent. It's it's so funny, too, because like the first words C- Queen Roger says, he's, uh, you know, somebody's harassing his workers saying like, oh, you're just a bunch of fat, bald guys. And Queen Roger comes out with this huge like Dolly Parton ass uh, wig on. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, you messing with my queers, fat boy. And for a second, you're like, oh, how is this going to go? Yeah. And turns out Roger is the most badass and like in touch with his emotions character in the entire game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he like he, he kicks the shit out of the guy. He's like, you know, just because I wear panties doesn't mean my balls disappeared. <laughs> it's it's like, he's great. And he, he's such an excellent example of how we can combat toxic masculinity with, uh, within ourselves as, as men. It's great. I, I really appreciated everything about it. Yeah. Uh, and it's also really funny because he, Tells Brad he's got nice big bitch tits. Yeah, he does. <laughs> so in that campfire scene, they kind of, they, they talk about it. Uh, whereas in the scene at the brothel, you kind of play through the events. And then uh, Queen gives Brad a talk about how all the men in the world, they have their bravado and their masculinity on display and talks about how that's all bullshit. And what really matters is, uh, quote, a good hug. That's what matters. And uh, there's this game doesn't have a lot of, heartfelt moments, but this was a very heartfelt uh, and very good moment here because it really shows you, uh, number one, that that's what this character is about, but that there are people like this in the world still. Like it's not just this, uh, you know, masculine hellscape. Uh, And then, like you said, at the end of that campfire scene, uh, Queen says, good luck, Brad. Don't stop rocking those wonderful man tits. And then that's how it ends. (laughs) It's one of the very few scenes that inspire hope in this entire game. It's, yep. it's this game is almost uh, bereft of hope. This is a, a deleterious world to live in, but we get something here that like almost makes you want to shed a tear. Yeah, and I'm glad that this was here because there was an earlier scene with a uh, uh, a brothel type environment in the hair club that I thought was uh, terrible. I hated the part in the hair club with uh, Farty. Yeah, Farty, who is, quote, stripped of his masculinity. And it's that Patton Oswalt joke, who wants to fuck the sad boy? And I, you know, for the record, I think that's a funny joke. But I I came across this and I was like, oh, okay, that's, you know, this is the other side of this type of situation. And I did not like that uh, one bit, even though I realized, like, yeah, think realistically about the situation. Like, people have sexual urges and stuff like they're probably going to do bad things to the people around them. But I I didn't like that 
But then I was uh, heartened to see the scene with with Queen, the multiple scenes with Queen later on. I am. So I don't know that joke. So forgive me if I'm just explaining it. What I took this to be as uh, the running joke in this game is that everybody's after Buddy because they, quote, want a piece of that. Right. But they always comment on how ugly she is. Right, right, right. And they're they're serving as a contrast to people like Brad and like Roger, right? They're the awful side of talks of masculinity. Uh, and they think Farty is the girl because yeah. – He's ugly and he's got a mustache. I if I just explained the the sad boy joke, I I apologize, but uh, no, you can it's cut it if you want. it's different. It's just uh, you know, I, I don't want to explain a stand up joke because um, I don't remember <laughs> it perfectly beat for beat. But it did remind me of that bit. If anyone knows Pat Oswalt's uh, bit, but yeah, you're right. Like a lot of what you're doing plot wise early in the game is you hear about this place where they've captured. Uh, a girl and everyone's having a turn uh, and then you go there and it's not buddy it's farty who's been captured he's just a truck driver uh and i don't know I, there was a i don't know why like this part the callousness of this part bothered me but it did uh and there's many other callous things that happen later on that i thought were quite good so were there any other uh, characters or maybe campfire scenes or anything like that that you wanted to shout out before we uh, kind of dive into what happens after you do find Buddy? Um, I think those are most of the campfire scenes um, that that I experienced, Nerns and Olens and then the group scene that I saw. Uh, there was maybe one or two others, but they didn't they didn't really stand out to me. There's one with uh, Bo Wyatt who is – he's just by himself. Brad's not there and he's uh, playing his guitar. Uh, what happened with Bo Wyatt is his brother Henry turned into a joy mutant, which is how you recruit Bo. You have to kill his brother Henry and get the record that he was holding on to. Right. You bring it back to Bo and he's like, my brother and I used to listen to this for years. Like maybe if I go with you, I can find him. And his campfire scene is him just playing guitar, messing up. And he's like, I could never do it as good as you. And he's talking about how much he just misses him and he hates this world. And he just, he never wanted any of this. He doesn't like fighting. Uh, which is appropriate because he's the bard. Like he can't do damage. Mm. It's it's a really really touching scene. Nice. I uh, I think I missed that either missed that character or never used them. Um, I'm glad that characters that are not in your active party can have campfire scenes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen uh, queens. But I didn't rest at those campfires very often, so I missed the chance for uh, a lot of those. A pro tip if you're playing is that the campfire scenes, I'm almost certain they will only play if the dialogue begins with uh, something like, oh, these embers are still warm. Oh, OK. Good to know. I think. I think. Right on. Um, there are a couple, I guess, other just notable story things that I don't know where else they fit, uh, because once we start talking about Brad and Buddy, they're definitely not going to fit. But uh, I enjoyed the part with Wally's, uh, the fast food place uh, with the the reverent you know church music playing with like a you know, like a choir and shit uh i i love that scene they go and they're it it's presented like they're going to go speak to god basically at this fast food box and i kind of got this uh impression like he's going to go up there and there's going to be a voice on the other end like the wizard of oz or something like that pretending to be god but now he just goes up and places an order for you know a burger and fries and then they leave and they're happy <laughs> it's so good too and uh you know it's it's not quite as funny whenever you find out what exactly is going on up there yeah. with uh with wally <laughs> <laughs> but it's great You're like dear lord i would like a double bacon cheeseburger combo no cheese and some nuggies yeah <laughs> amen <laughs> yeah that was good uh really enhanced by like the graphics in there like there's these beautiful beams of light like coming down and the music is great so that scene was super memorable. And um, I thought Satan was really funny in this game. Like this game's depiction of Satan, it's just this big fucking guy with a, you know, like a mullet and a beard and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. No shirt. Uh, I thought that was really good. So so he's a streamer. Is he? Yeah, I I think it was like a Kickstarter thing. Oh. Um, but his real name is Mike uh, and I forget his streamer ID. Uh, he used to be a Let's Player. I don't think he does that anymore. But yeah, he's like an actual dude in real life. He did a, he did a Reddit AMA as Mike. In okay. Game. 
I just thought it was really funny. I, I have in my notes that I thought it was funny that Satan is a guy named Mike who lives in the back of a truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that and that fight is really hard. Uh, I had I did that like right before the end of the game, so I could just load my save file and just you know. And I'm glad that I did because he let off the fight by permadeathing Nern and Harvey Alabaster. Jesus. Uh, yeah. 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 I was I was not having a good time. <laughs> Uh, I guess this is the time to uh, to say that I never had anybody get permadeath by a boss in the entire game uh, or a joy wow. mutant or anything like that. It never happened. Even the first time I fought Satan and I got party wiped, so I had to restart anyway, it didn't use a one hit kill move. Then the second time I fought Satan, I used that pissed off status effect and that worked really well. But yeah, never had anyone get like their neck broken or backbreaker or whatever those moves are called never happened wow count yourself lucky yeah. um there are only a couple of joy mutant fights in the game that are required um but if you do any of the optional ones to like get uh you know the keys to mike's truck is an optional one um some weapons some secret locations then you know some of those joy mutants are just programmed to use those moves more often so it's i mean again it's the risk and reward you don't have to fight them but if yeah. you choose to I actually think maybe some of them use those moves on Brad, but they don't work if they use them on Brad. So maybe I got lucky. Oh. Just, yeah, lucky there. Sure, sure, sure. So I guess before we start talking about Buddy and Brad, real quick, you get some really significant story choices uh, throughout. And these are the choices that you can get to either sacrifice people or sacrifice something of yours. Uh, They start out with that, you know, fairly simple one, sacrifice Terry or lose the three items, which I, you know, looking back on it, I shouldn't have been so precious about those items, but I thought the game was harder than it actually is. So I sacrifice Terry, but Buzzo keeps showing up at different points throughout the story to torment Brad. So throughout these, you have two separate choices where you can lose an arm. You can lose both arms in the game. Uh, There is a forced Russian roulette section where you can lose characters forever. And there is another section later where you can sacrifice your whole party or they will cut off one of Buddy's nipples. So in those story choices, and I know you've played the game several times, but I guess like the first time, maybe if you can remember, what did you do in those? So as far as the arm scenes go, there there are two of them. Yeah. Because you got two arms. That's right. <laughs> if you can believe it. <laughs> um, the first time, I, I'll be completely honest with you, I have never spared Terry. I always give him up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I know I shouldn't, but that's just how I roll. The second one uh, is really interesting because what happens is, I believe if memory serves, it's uh, all three of your party members that are with you or taking your other arm. And is that right? It is uh, giving up all of your items, which this is very late in the game. You have a ton of items that are very helpful. Uh, So, And I didn't know if that counted your equipment too. But it's, yeah, it says give up all your items or lose your other arm. The full party one is when you get the choice to give up your party or one of Buddy's nipples. That's that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, with the second arm choice, you have three options. You can give up your party or um, excuse me, you can give up your items. You can give up your arm. And there's a third choice that says, why are you doing this? Yeah. And this goes back to Austin Jorgensen. You know, he is subverting expectations as far as JRPGs go. JRPG players, they want to see the whole story. They want to get as much lore and dialogue as possible. They want to, you know, the lines are money. They want to get their money's worth. And if you choose that, what I love about it, because this is exactly what would happen in real life, right? If you say, why are you doing this? Uh, Buzzo will say, like, you know, something antagonistic towards you. I don't remember. And he does both. He cuts your arm off and takes all of your items. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a fuck you to the player, but it's, it works because we are so trained as players to seek out all the dialogue options. And 
up to this point, if you're paying attention, you know that that's going to work against you. Yeah, I don't think this game has a lot of situations where, number one, you don't have a lot of dialogue choices, but when you do, uh, you don't really get extra information like this. Uh, Things just keep playing out, especially when Buzzo is concerned. So uh, have you ever gotten to the point where you have no arms? Oh, yeah. My first full playthrough, I I want no arms. Okay, me too. And it's really funny because... uh, you can still ride your bike. You have to <laughs> yeah. like use your chin to steer and you cr- you climb with your mouth. Yep. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's absurd, but I thought that was really funny. Um, yeah, the the first arm choice, uh, he was going to kill Mad Dog, and Mad Dog was like a fucking gangster in combat for me, so I did not want to lose Mad Dog, so I gave up the arm. Um, giving up your whole party, that's, that's a lot. So Buddy had to lose the nipple, and I think there's a reason why that choice is more severe than the other ones. And I chose to give up the other arm instead of my items, partly because I had a bunch of items, but partly because I'm playing a video game and I wanted to see what would happen. So that happened. Right. Russian roulette, I lost a character named Rage, who is a, I think he's mm-hmm. an alcoholic. I think he's a football player, if I remember right. Um, he died in Russian roulette. Everyone else was fine. So... I don't remember if this was trying to get buckets or just the first time through, but I allotted myself two characters to die that I knew I was like, I, you know, I'm thinking exactly like Brad, which is what this game wants you to do. This game wants you to make these horrible decisions and, and ask yourself why you're doing this. So I was thinking like Brad and I was like, okay, these two are expendable. Uh, and they did die, but then I made it through. This is the only part of the game where if somebody said this is, horseshit i would say yeah okay like i you're not wrong it can be for sure like again i i think i have a more positive outlook on it because i only lost one character and they were immediately replaced by mad dog who is better than rage anyway so oh maybe what we uh we neglected to say you have to win russian roulette three times yeah yeah i just i just got lucky they the three people in a row just died on the other team after i lost rage and then if you want to get a character named Buckets, you have to win 10 times. Okay. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's, that's excessive. I, I saved scum that, save scummed that 100%. Yeah. Is, so I think I heard somewhere, it might've been on, uh, watch out for fireballs. I think they mentioned this. You can do Russian roulette later to like make money. Oh yeah. Okay. I never, I didn't even know that. Um, so you said that this kind of, mini game or whatever forces you to think like brad you would literally be like well this this character is expendable let's take him to russian roulette and try and make some money yeah oh exactly it's fucked up yeah (laughs) yeah um quick question for you because these are pretty significant choices but they don't change the story whatsoever to my knowledge everything will still play out exactly the same Uh, even if you choose to make the selfless choices by giving up your arms, things will still play out the same. Does this cause any issue for you? The fact that like you sacrificed and nothing changes or is it more that, yeah, you sacrificed, but the things that are really, really important, uh, Brad is still a selfish asshole when it really comes down to it at the end of the story. Like basically you can do these sacrificial acts, but there's no redeeming Brad in this game. So, Does that bother you when these choices are presented to you? Ultimately, the only choices that you can make in the game don't really matter for the character and for the story. I don't think it bothers me um, because those choices exist more so to flesh out who Buzzo is and just how twisted he is and to what lengths he's willing to go. Um, Even the choice with Buddy that you mentioned before, uh, Buzzo will say, She's either getting her nipple cut off or I am killing all three of your party members. You can't win. If you choose your party members and have Buddy's nipple cut off, he does it and he says, before he does it, he says, remember, he's doing this, not me. Mm. And then he does it. And then he gives it to you as a souvenir, by the way. And it's an equipable item. (laughs) It lowers all your stats. Yeah. And if you choose Buddy, uh, he does kill your party members and he's like, wow, you really are a heartless prick, aren't you? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. He's like, you can't win. And it's it's just showing you how hostile and horrible Buzzo is to Brad. And we don't know why for a very, very long time. 
um, that's really expounded upon in Joyful. Right. So I am going to take this opportunity to, uh, can you give like a, a quick explanation of why Buzzo is tormenting Brad like this? So here's the deal with Buzzo. And this is, by the way, major spoilers for Lisa the Joyful. Yeah. As well as part of the epilogue for Lisa the Painful. Buzzo was, it, it feels a little weird to say lovers because they're children, but uh, Buzzo and Lisa were dating. They were love interests. And the thing is, is that Lisa, even though she's a tragic character, she is not necessarily wholly redeemable. She was very horrible to Buzzo, very manipulative, and basically used him. Mm-hmm. I think Jorgensen clarified on Twitter, um, a lot of the lore will be cited in the Lisa wikis from Twitter. People will just tweet questions at him and he would clarify in tweets on Twitter. And what he said was, Lisa did love Buzzo, uh, and Buzzo loved her wholly and unconditionally. But she did love Buzzo, but she was also extremely manipulative and used him. And what ended up happening one day, and the reason that he got the nickname Buzzo, is that Lisa really wanted to escape Marty's sexual abuse. So she got a buzzsaw. And what she did first was she wanted to prove, she wanted Buzzo to prove that he would do anything for her unconditionally. So she asked him to cut the paw off of a cat, a live cat with the buzzsaw. Hmm. And he, he does not want to do it. So she, I mean, to put it bluntly, she uses manipulation tactics. She says, you know, don't you love me? Don't you trust me? Don't you want my situation to stop? He knows about the sexual abuse and she's saying, look, don't you want this to stop? And so he does it. And then Lisa says, okay, now that you've proved you can do that, I need you to do that to my face. Take the buzzsaw to my face. Yeah. And Buzzo says, no, no. He says, absolutely not. And she says, don't, don't you understand? This is the only way. If, If you scar my face in this way, he will no longer want me. Marty will no longer be interested. I can be free of this hell. We can be free together. I can be free of this hell. You need to do this for me. And he does it. And, you know, spoiler alert, it doesn't work because, I mean, this is extremely dark and terrible, but, you know, sexual assault isn't about attraction. It's it's about awful people wanting to feel like they're in power, to assert power and dominance over others. It's horrible. It's it's messed up. But um, that is how he got the nickname Buzzo. So he feels that Brad is responsible for Lisa's death. He knows that Brad was aware of what's going on So with regarding the abuse. So in his mind, he thinks that Brad is complicit to it. It's Brad's fault. He didn't do anything to stop it. So he is now dedicating his life to tormenting Brad into seeing what he believes to be the truth, that he is not, Brad is, that that is to say, that Brad is not a redeemable person and has no qualities worth redeeming to, to allowing him to live his life, that, that he is a horrible person. That is kind of Buzzo's whole deal. Right. Okay. It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. And... Like, as it relates to this game, the painful, if you don't play the the joyful and you don't know the story from the first, Buzzo seems like a just a really random character that pops in to torment Brad for no reason. When I I feel I feel like this is one of the weakest parts of the story if you just have that context from the painful. He just shows up. He puts Brad in these impossible choices and then he leaves and that's that's basically all he does. And like I'm glad that it got uh expanded later on, but it seemed just like a really random thing to be happening. Uh and it was never explained and I I don't think that that I don't think it's good. I'll I'll just say that as like with just this context here in this game. I it, it's it just seemed really weird and then that explanation helps explain 
why, but uh, yeah, it's it's real strange. Uh, it just seems like he doesn't have anyone left to take this out on, so he picked Brad. I mean, Marty's still around. You go find him. Yeah, so I I agree with you. This is one area. So, okay, backing up for a second. Joyful was only ever conceived of because of the Kickstarter. Um, it met a Kickstarting goal. From what I read originally, he didn't originally want to do the Joyful. He just wanted it to wrap up there. I think there are a lot of things that are left ambiguous that work in this game. For example, I think it's fine that we don't know exactly why the flash happened. Yeah. We never learn exactly why the flash. We learn about joy, where that came from, why it's being used. We learn who Buddy is. We learn all of this in Joyful, but not the flash. And I think that's fine because there there's a level of disbelief that you need to suspend in fiction. And when yeah. everything starts to get, be explained to the reader or the player or whatever, it begins to become plotting and P-L-O-D-D-I-N-G and too much and heavy handed. Persona 5, I remember feeling this way in Persona 5. They just kept explaining everything. And you just, you've just got to have some trust in your in your viewers, right? Um, so I'm fine with them not explaining the Flash, but not explaining Buzzo's motivations, I agree with you. It is not a good choice. And I'm glad that they fleshed him out because that is, it, it changes the way you view him. He's no longer just a psychopathic madman. Yeah. He is a tragic, tragic figure who, you know, everybody in this game is a tragic figure to some extent. Nobody is necessarily free of sin, but everybody has reason to be broken. And Buzzo is no exception. Yeah. What made it feel worse was the fact that like Buzzo doesn't target Brad randomly. You can tell that he knows Brad and that he hates Brad with like every fiber of his being but they don't tell you any of why or what their relationship was at all. Just that he claims to know who Brad really is. So, yeah. Thanks for the explanation. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, a benefit to anyone listening who just played The Painful and is wondering the same thing. So let's talk about the meat of the story, uh, things that it touches on, because again, a lot of it is just, you know, bits and small little story things and gathering up party members. And then the story, I think, really kicks off when uh, Brad finally does catch up with Buddy. And you expect a happy reunion. You expect Buddy to be maybe in danger, but you expect her to be happy, or at least I did, to see Brad. Uh, because Brad's there to rescue her. Uh, you are a savior. You're a video game protagonist, after all. But that's not what happened. Before you meet Buddy, you meet some of uh, Brad's old friends, Rick and Sticky, who are trying to keep Brad away from her. But Brad um, it has this tunnel vision. He beats the fuck out of uh, Rick and then, um, you know, goes on to find buddy in the cave and um buddy doesn't want anything to do with brad when you meet her and this was kind of surprising to me and i want to get your take on this because i think that this requires buy-in to story that was not told to you i think it's in the joyful but in the painful again it's not told to you it requires a buy-in that Brad was worse than he was portrayed at the beginning of the game. Like at the beginning, it shows Buddy, clearly she wants to go out in the world. She feels trapped in the house. But Brad, I felt like, with what they showed, took care of her the best he could. Um, there was that scene where they, you know, she he lets him put up makeup on him and, you know, they have a good time. He puts a mask on her so she can go outside and then you get to this point and Buddy hates his fucking guts. And I think it, it it's one of two things. It either requires buy-in that it was worse than they showed or buy-in that you're seeing it from Brad's point of view and he's unreliable. What do you think? So it it's kind of both, but also a little bit of a secret third thing. 
that okay <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that I'll clear you in on. Um, the, so there is one tiny little bit that we get clued into in the joyful and that is um before the events of buddy getting kidnapped um if you remember if you go back after buddy is kidnapped and you go into the hut uh after you find rick i think it's rick lying dead uh there's somebody else that's dead in the hut uh we learned that that was buddy probably because at the beginning of joyful we see a flashback brad brought brings back this guy who's knocked out and tied up and he's like okay buddy here's a knife you have to kill him He's like, this is this is just the reality reality of the world. You have to kill him. Make it quick. Don't let him suffer. Just do it. And the guy wakes up and he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you don't have to do this. Um, <laughs> that's really the only thing. But the challenge that I would give to viewers that are thinking that this is unrealistic is to consider it from Buddy's perspective. It's not so much that Brad is an unreliable narrator. He's not a narrator at all. Uh, we we can see very clearly as players Brad's motivation warping, whereas Brad would not see that. He would see to the very end that he is just and good, and we know that yeah. that's not the case. But from Buddy's perspective, all she's ever known is a, war, a, a life without autonomy. Everything that she has ever done has been under Brad's supervision and his command. And this isn't the same as us when we were teenagers, 12, 13, 14, saying that, oh, we don't, we can't make our own decisions. Life isn't fair. We could still go to separate rooms. We could go outside. We could have a snack. Buddy does not get any of that. She basically has to exist solely by how Brad tells her to. Um, so she becomes intensely resentful because of this. And compiling onto that, all she sees of Brad is somebody cold. He won't let her call him. Uh, he won't let her call him dad. He says like, I don't like that. You don't get to call me that. Um, he is obviously an alcoholic and, and a joy addict. And throughout the events of painful, she sees him. The only time she sees him from her point of view, because remember she doesn't know about Lisa or any of the backstory. She only knows Brad uh, and Brad's childhood friends who are, telling her like, Hey, this guy is dangerous. He is bad news. And buddy says, Oh, he's bad news. And then what does she see? Brad coming in, murdering people saying, I'm doing this for you. But to her, all she sees is senseless bloodshed from somebody that is cranked out of his mind. So I don't think it's surprising at all that she sees him as a total monster because that's what he kind of is. It's this weird gray area where like a little bit of both is true. He has just, cause in the beginning and it slowly starts to lose its footing and he starts to toe the line on when does the mean when do the means stop justifying the end you know what i mean yeah that's kind of my view on it i i think she is well within her right to see brad as somebody that is completely psychotic I agree with you. I, I agree that it makes sense for her to feel this way, but you do have to do a bit of reading between the lines to reach that point. Because the this is one of you know the game shows you a bunch of really explicit things they want you to see, but they don't show you a lot of this. Uh, a lot of it is for you to make up uh, your mind. One of the things that struck me about this, and we'll get into it uh, when we talk about. Brad's continued pursuit of Buddy after Buddy disappears after this part. But the fact that he is maybe at the very, very beginning, he was doing it to protect Buddy, but then it warps into him doing it for himself. He feels like he needs to redeem himself rather than take care of this person. This is all about his uh, redemption. He needs this, not she needs this, which I think other people could very easily pick up on. Uh, and I mean, if you didn't get the buy-in immediately, then you would get it soon after, I feel like. The reason I asked about Brad being an unreliable narrator is because they could show you those backstory scenes from Brad's point of view, basically. Like, Brad doesn't narrate on what's going on, and later on, you see the objective truth, but in flashbacks, you could be seeing that from someone's point of view. That's what I meant. Uh, there. The other thing um, about the part that's in the joyful, I wish that was just in this. Like, I wish it yeah. feels like retconning to me. 
It feels like uh, they got feedback that this seemed abrupt or unexplained or something. And they're like, well, you know what? We'll put in a very explicit scene of her making uh, Brad making her kill a guy. Why couldn't that if that was always the idea, why couldn't that have been a flashback we saw in the painful instead of a DLC? That's my feeling on that in particular. But I don't think this storyline passes or fails based on that one thing. So it's not a deal breaker, just a yeah, the like the second thing about this story that is not explained as much as it could or should have been, and then it's like, oh, it's in the DLC. Well, Totally. No, I I totally get you. I I agree. That and Buzzo's backstory are the two things in the DLC that are really, really important to know. You also learn a little more about Rando, but I mean, you you can glean that from the painful um, and why Rando is so important to Brad and and all of that. You know, I I don't remember if when Joyful originally released, if it was I want to say it was like five bucks. Maybe I don't, I don't actually remember. Uh, of course now with the definitive edition, it's like 20 or something because you know, that's how companies work. But yeah, <laughs> I, I do. There, there is a part of me. Joyful is not very long. It's like five hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not a huge ask to play it, especially if you're interested. Like if you get to the end and you have more questions, you're going to know whether or not you're down for another five hours yeah. Especially five hours wherein you play as Buddy and and for a little bit of time rando, which is really, really cool. I can go either way. I do wish Buzzo's backstory and that scene with Buddy was in painful for sure, though. Yeah, it, it would have basically erased it, it would have erased that question entirely uh, if if that was in painful, basically both of those questions. So all that to say, Buddy is not happy to see Brad and uh, Buddy leaves uh, with the help of Buzzo. There's a quote, there's a question that Buzzo asks Buddy uh, when they're about to take off. He asks uh, who Brad is to her, and she says she doesn't know anymore. So uh, then uh, Buzzo forces Brad to take Joy, and then they're gone when he wakes up, uh, I believe. Uh, And then during that conversation too, Buddy tells Brad that he's been a terrible uh, person, um, a terrible father. He's a, he's a nothing but a drug addict. And I think that this is a time to, this is the thing I was talking about earlier, where I was like, there's a bunch of stuff about Brad being a shitty person and a lot of people positing he's a shitty person because he's a drug addict. And I didn't know if this game was trying to say something about drug addiction, either through that, through all the times that people say that Brad is a terrible drug addict when like half the people in the world are drug addicts, half the people you can pick up in your party. And then also the fact that drug addicts turn into these horrible mutants at the end of that. I didn't know if there was like a significance to that being the result of this in here. Like when you played this, did you get the sense that there is a message about addiction being said here? I truly and genuinely believe there is not. Okay. Um, I I can tell you so, and this is more spoilers for Joyful. um, Yeah. The reason that Joy was made was basically there is a man named Dr. Yato. He's the one playing the trumpet in The Painful. He created Joy with Buzzo as a lab assistant, uh, basically to turn everybody into Joy mutants and rule the world. It's not, I mean, it's kind of lame. (laughs) The the ending of Joyful is kind of lame. Okay. <laughs> but that that was his big plan. And, you know, Buzzo knew this, which is why he was force feeding Brad Joy. This is why he gave it to him in the very beginning when you first find him, when they're they're like uh singing that hymn, I've got the joy down in my heart. Very cool scene also. Mm-hmm. So so that's that. I, I think that's just purely plot. I don't think it's saying anything about like people suffering from addiction turning into monsters. I don't think it's that deep. Okay. As far as making Brad out to be a bad person because he's a drug addict i think it's more the killing (laughs) i don't i don't mean to be glib about it i and that was a bit flippant and glib but (laughs) brad is confronted so many times throughout the game about his drug use of joy and it's shown it's shown why he continues to do it so we're meant to feel sympathy for him he does it to cope with the visions of marty and lisa yeah and and we know this, Buddy doesn't know this, but we know this. 
And it's why Brad feels so bad. He's like, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. Or like, you know, if you actually don't do joy, he will say like, you know, I'm clean. And buddy will say like, even still, you know, you still kill everybody. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm usually pretty sensitive about that stuff, about like how people with addiction are being portrayed. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up in a family where that was victimized or um, weaponized, excuse me, the opposite of victimized, you know, like, oh, yeah. you know, drug addicts and alcoholics, it's their fault. That is so, so not true. Wildly not true. And I, I really, really uh, get upset when people imply that that is the case. Yeah. I, and, and all this to say, I'm not trying to say like, well, because I think that my opinion's right. I'm just saying I, I didn't see it as a commentary on drug addiction and people with addiction in our society. Okay. Um, whether that's them, whether that's the generational cycle, I, I just, I didn't catch a whiff of that. I, I will agree with you that I a hundred percent agree that this game is not saying that it is Brad's fault that he's an addict, like that he brought this on himself. He made a, a willing choice and that he's forever a piece of shit because he he tried it and got addicted. I don't think anyone's saying that. I think that they do comment on the fact that he is an addict uh, many times and things that are associated with that make him not a good person. Actions that he takes. There's a part where Brad uh, shakes uh, Sticky down in the game, trying to get drugs from him. Um, You can imagine that Brad has probably done bad things to get some because he has done bad things for less. Uh, So I I will agree that I don't think this game is trying to say that it is people's fault if they're addicted to something, 100%. This was one of those things where like your choices as the player don't jive with the story for me because you can play this game and not take joy and you know, people will call that out and Brad will say, I don't do it anymore. And they're like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really matter anyway. You're terrible. Uh, Or they won't say that. They will just say, you know, you're a drug addict, you're a piece of shit, even if you haven't done any in the game. And I know that that doesn't change what happens in the events before the game, but it's one of those things where like, you can choose to do the right thing or you can choose to maybe try to help Brad out is a better way to say it. But nobody responds to that. And if it's that they don't respond to it because Brad has done other terrible things that make people just not want to associate with him, that makes sense to me. Uh, But there were a couple parts where it was like, Brad's trying to shake Sticky down for for joy, but I have a bunch of joy in my inventory. Like that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I think that was a flashback. Was it a flashback? I'm almost positive. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Uh, my bad then. But yeah, that the the general point is like, I wasn't quite sure what the game was trying to say about it. And there are things that other people's personal experience might, it might lead them to th- think about this in a different way. I don't have a personal experience to connect to this. So it is just seeing what's given to me and trying to figure out what they're trying to say, which is why I asked in the first place. You know, you you mentioned the sticky or Rick scene where Brad was shaking him down. I think that's why ultimately a lot of people will just brush Brad off if he says, you know, I'm clean now. It's because it's just his reputation. You know, his his yeah. friends have confronted him. He hurt him. them in the past. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, his friends have confronted him about this time and time again. Like, you've got to stop this, dude. You've got to stop this. And he just every time and, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but that's sometimes you have to be that blunt when dealing with somebody that is troubled and doesn't want to hear it. You have to be like, you are not in a good place right now, man. And yeah, I, so I just assume that was his past. Um, I kind of, to be honest with you, like, like you said, if you don't take joy with, uh, exception for the cutscenes, the dialogue will change and people will, Brad will say like, no, I'm clean now. I kind of wish they just wouldn't have included that. You know, um, just don't even make that an option because it does bring up this friction. It's like, OK, well, Brad's clean and now people are still like <laughs> they, they just don't care. Yeah, I will agree with you that, like, even if he's clean right now, the damage has been done because ultimately this is a pretty small world. When you think about who the main players are, they've all known each other for a long time. So the damage has been done from Brad 
it does make sense that they wouldn't want to associate with him and fully forgive him and welcome them, welcome him into their lives uh, with open arms, because uh, that's not the only thing he's done to them. So that makes sense. <laughs> So um, moving forward, the thing with Buddy going forward is Buddy's been introduced to the uh, plan and her like supposed role in the future of humanity here. So Buddy wants autonomy from Brad, and she keeps telling Brad anytime they get a chance to talk that she gets to choose what she's going to do, and she's down with the plan to repopulate, basically. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's ever like explicitly told, but it is implied that people have told her, you are the last remaining woman. You, we need to repopulate the world. Otherwise, humans are going to die out. I do want to make a note. There's a line from Buddy where she says uh, she's ready for this and that, quote, Uncle Sticky showed me. And I want to uh, note that is confirmed to be a non-sexual thing, Uncle yeah. Sticky showing her, uh, because you could see that and be like, oh, what the fuck? But it's not. It is confirmed to not be like that. And that's exactly what Brad thinks, too. Yeah, yeah, and he gets real fucking mad when that happens. Yeah. Uh, and he, he, I think at this, he gets really mad and, like, grabs her and, like, basically kidnaps her again. So this is another point in the story where I think it requires some buy-in, uh, although this is not that ridiculous. Um, the plan to repopulate with one uh, woman would end poorly, um, it's pretty understood that there is not enough genetic diversity to make that a viable plan. But given the circumstances, it doesn't take that long for me to personally understand why they would try, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is another this is like the second point or maybe the second point. I don't know. The biggest point in the game where it's like at, you just has, have to accept that this is a work of fiction and yeah. This is just, it's a trope, you know, of course that's not possible. That would break down within just a few generations, not to mention, like, I don't think one human body could handle that much. Right. I mean, one, <laughs> right. one birth on the human body alone is fairly traumatic from what I understand. So, I mean, yes, of course it's not possible, but it's also, it's fiction. It's a trope. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, if, if this is what sticks in your craw, I don't know that you'll enjoy the rest of the game. Yeah. what What's good about this, uh, in my opinion, is that it is a fairly ridiculous plan if people are in the know. But society has basically broken down in this game. No one's fucking, no one's reading science books in this uh, story. So it, it makes sense to me that like people would consider it because what other choice do you have? Just, you know, everyone dies. You don't even try. Like that doesn't make sense to me either. So it makes sense that someone would make the case to Buddy and that, you know, it would be a shitty thing for her to go through, to put herself through, but it would make sense that she would, you know, someone would make a selfless decision like that, especially after everything she's been through and not being given choices or anything. But what I like about this the most is that when Brad is presented with this as like her possible future, he doesn't really bring up how it would affect her. He doesn't bring up that this is a plan that's not going to work. He just cares about himself. He just cares about saving her because he needs a second chance. He keeps saying that throughout the entire second half of the game. And this is one of the things about this story that I like so much is that it shows you Brad getting deeper and deeper into this like savior syndrome that all these terrible things are happening to the people or the person that he supposedly loves, but all he can think about is himself. Exactly. So yeah, at, at a certain point, it's no longer about buddy ever. It's not about, he's only thinking about making up for what he perceives as something was his fault. Yeah. And, you know, it's clear as day to us. It's clear as day to everybody except for Brad. Everybody brings it up to him. They're like, you know, 
of course, nobody wants to be in this situation, but what else do we have, Brad? Yeah. And, and Brad just keeps saying, no, I have to save her. I have to save her. I have to, this is my chance. This is my chance to make things right. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's cool because we're meant to feel sympathy for Brad on a certain level. Yeah, but of course. We can feel sympathy for him and also despise what he's trying to do. Yeah, you can feel sympathy for him and you can even understand why he would be so motivated to do something that makes him feel like he's a good person. But then he goes and does all of these things and he he's incredibly selfish. He uh sacrifices, abandons his entire party and then later kills the entire party, kills anyone who gets in his way. Because he just he takes this so far, but I I like how like it's very easy to empathize with where this started, because uh, Brad's life has been fucking terrible. Like his entire life has been awful. Everyone wants to feel good about themselves. Everyone wants to feel like they're a good person. Brad sees a chance to do the right thing, and maybe started out with noble intentions at the beginning, but that drive to redeem himself makes it so much worse as the game goes on and you know as we get to the ending and stuff it it just keeps getting worse and worse for everybody and then keeps getting worse for Brad so i really like this as like a central theme once you meet buddy and you figure out everything that's actually happening how everybody feels i really like this yeah it really highlights this idea like the darkness in the hearts of men is Anybody is two steps away, two horrible accidents away in their life from everything turning upside down. Yeah. None of us, I mean, none of us are truly ever safe. Um, And you can expand that however you want financially, you know, morally, whatever. Um, Another thing to note, too, at the end, Buddy explicitly states, she's like, I want this. I, for the first time in my life, have a choice Mm -hmm. and feel like I am important and like I am an individual. Yeah. And we as, you know, we as the players, we can say like, you know, oh, well, that'll never work. It's not scientifically possible. But like Buddy, the person in this universe, this is the only time she has ever felt like she is a human being. And now the one person that never granted her that before is trying to take it away from her. I so I I I totally see her side of it. And like, don't get me wrong, still feel sympathy for Brad, but like. He's by that end point, he is so far gone, Um, which makes like one of the best lines in the game is in that final stand where he's like, you know, I've been dead for 35 years. Today I live. Yeah. Such a such a good line. But at that point, we're kind of rooting against him. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a very uh, I wrote as a very action movie line, uh, but I can see it from Brad's perspective. And you're right. By the time you get to that point, you're controlling Brad. You have to defeat people playing as Brad but you don't really hope he succeeds. It's it's one of those games where you play for a while and then you realize you're the villain in the story. Brad is the one causing pain on all these people. Uh, well, he's not the only one. The world is full of pain in this game, but uh, everybody involved in this, and especially with Buddy, yeah, it's all coming from Brad. So uh, do you think that Buddy knew about Marty because there's that point where she spends time with him and she tells um, she tells Brad that Marty was a better father than uh, than Brad ever was. So you think that she didn't know at all? You don't think Brad ever said anything or nobody ever told Buddy? I, I'm almost positive nobody did. Uh, if, if Jorgensen clarified that, I just forgot about it. But, you know, I can't imagine Marty would bring that up. No. <laughs> but... I don't, I know, I know like maybe, I don't know if Sticky or Rick or, um, yeah, Sticky or Rick said anything to her. Yeah. I'm not sure. Don't you think that Sticky or Rick who've known Brad his whole life would just say it at some point? Like, cause they, they've been talking with Buddy. They, they obviously talk about Brad. Like, don't you think someone at some point would have been like, well, you know, his, his father, treated him like absolute garbage so yeah i'm not sure i mean it might just be like anytime they do get to interact with her there's so many other pressing things like you know people actively trying to come and steal her and cause violence and probably yeah. kill them i really don't know yeah okay it, it's just one of those things where it was like 
maybe it's just one of those uh, dramatic irony things where like you know something the characters don't know you you see marty and buddy and you're like oh, buddy he's bad news too like and he i don't know he doesn't seem like he's really changed all that much he's still chilling drinking stuff like that you don't have any real reason to assume that he's going to be a nurturing father figure for buddy do you not really. I mean, we see him speaking very sweetly to her. And then when Brad confronts him, he's like he expresses remorse, whether or not it's true or believable. That's up to interpretation. But from Buddy's point of view, she is seeing a father figure that is actually being kind to her and her mm -hmm. former father figure coming in and saying, I'm going to kill this man. You need to stay back. <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah, you're right. So and, and, you know, very tragically in the fight against Marty, Buddy steps up and Brad at that point is beyond the pale when it comes to morphing into a joy mutant and ends yeah. up hitting her. Yeah. Yep. So at that point, like Buddy can no longer ever have a repaired relationship with Brad. Yeah. I thought that boss fight was interesting from a like mechanics telling a story perspective uh, to uh, Marty doesn't really put up a big fight. Um, he just throws glass bottles at Brad, but he has a bunch of moves that can make Brad have the crying status effect, uh, which I thought was interesting from a story perspective and very fitting. Um, and then at the end, you have a choice in quote, air quotes, a choice to kill or um, spare Marty. Uh, Marty says that he's changed, but Brad kills him because I clicked to spare him and Brad still kills him. Yeah, yeah. I th I think that's supposed to suggest that Brad is like, the transformation into joy mutant has be begun mm, yeah. because the, the whole fight is preceded with the flashes of like red intestinal uh, screen art that we see that mm. is associated with him going into fits of joy rage. Yeah. And, and two uh, joy mutants, one of their main moves is to cry. So when Brad begins to cry, oh, okay. that's not Brad feeling bad. That's Brad turning. I thought it was a, you know, resurfacing memories not that brad feels bad or feels remorse or something like that but you know super strong emotions in lots of forms can make you cry yeah yeah it could be both i didn't see the uh the joy mutant transformation happening until later at least like when brad's fighting like 30 people at one time then you start to be like oh is this happening like he's you know superhuman strength and stuff like that yeah, and you start to get moves like bite and scream, well, and, and notably, <laughs> I think, I think, I think the uh, the move that you can use, cry. The description just says, "Help me, Lisa." Oh, oh, interesting. It doesn't say like you know when he does like Buster punches, like a flurry of fists. No, it's like, "Help me, Lisa." Interesting. I had bite the whole time because Brad had no arms, so that was my oh. melee attack for most of the game. So I didn't notice that. Yeah, it's a it, it's a really powerful moment. Yep. So Brad kills like the entire uh, rando army in like the last stand. Uh, this is after he kills his party members who take up Buddy's side and say that she's doing the right thing. And they try to get Brad to stop, but he's he's never going to stop. He's never going to stop. He fights and kills the party members. In this scene, uh, Nern was there. Uh, Nern says for the first time in his life, he's speechless, which I thought was a good line from Nern. <laughs> Um, and then uh, you fight Rando. Uh, Brad is really badly injured during this. Uh, his character portrait gets really fucked up during this uh, scene. And then um, I didn't understand during this. Maybe you can shed some light on this. During the Rando fight, uh, his name changes from Rando to Broken Man. And then when you kill him, he says, you really are the best. Thank you for everything. Does this mean... Rando was that student at the beginning of the game who like wanted Brad to teach him martial arts. Yes, exactly. That is okay. exactly it. That was Rando. His real name is Dustin Dusty. And uh, something, I mean, you can glean that from this. And that's why Rando doesn't want to fight. Like the whole time it's like Rando doesn't want to do this. It's why he uses Armstrong style. It's why he turns into broken man because he's like the adoptive father that I've loved is murdering me. Right. Um, and that's that's clarified in Joyful, too, is like Brad actually did like take Rando under his wing as an adoptive kid. And uh, he calls Buddy Sis in Joyful. And, uh, you know, he he kind of bonds with her because he's like, yeah, he wouldn't let me call him dad either. Again, that I wish it would have been in painful, but it's not like a deal breaker that it wasn't, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's that's part of why that fight is so 
emotionally weighted. I only figured it out after the fact when questioning why he would say you really are the best. Thank you for everything. And like, why, why is, oh, you, like you're the best fighter. Okay. He was his, maybe the pupil conservation of detail, I guess. So after killing everybody, Brad is too hurt to really do anything else to buddy. And uh, you get this, well, beginning of the ending here where Brad is dying, at least looks like he's dying. And um, he kind of stops trying to control Buddy and he just begs Buddy to give him a hug as he dies. And he says he wants to know what it's like to, I don't know, to feel warmth and love from somebody. And uh, you can choose to hug him or not. Um, I chose to give uh, Brad a hug. And if you choose that, he asks um, if he did the right thing as he falls down and supposedly dies. Do you know what happens if you choose not to? Does Buddy just walk away? I think she, I think she just stands there. I'm not. I can't remember to be honest. Okay, but but nothing like you know, no extra dialogue or anything like that. I don't think so. And it's worth mentioning too. Like this entire time, she's really giving it to him. She's like, "You've taken everything from me. Why mm-hmm. are you trying to hurt me so much?" And you know, he'll try to say like, "You know, stop. I I know you hate me." And and he's like, "I just want to make this right." And she says, "Don't preach to me." Mm. such a good line yeah she yells at him that she was the one he was supposed to be protecting and he ended up being the one that hurt her the most yeah during that ending part there um and it's i think that the game despite clearly positing brad as a villain from like maybe the halfway point or at least yeah the the halfway point maybe when you find buddy for the first time and you realize that everyone hates brad you start to put the pieces together as to why all the way till the end when he's doing this horrible, selfish thing, uh, only doing all these things for himself. He has killed everybody who ever like, gave him a chance, basically. You still feel bad for him when this happens, or at least I did. And it's a credit to uh, characterization and writing that you, you still don't want this, you know, you still want Buddy to give him a hug at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a complicated scene. And that you're met with the fake out credits, which you don't yes. know it's fake out at first until they start saying things like, help me, Lisa. Yeah, they're weird right from the beginning. They're weird credits. So you kind of get the feeling. And um, yeah, and then um, I was wondering the whole game, once you learn that that's where those those monsters come from, is that they're people who use joy that turned into these mutants. I was wondering when you were going to see that actually happen to Brad or if that was something that happened in the joyful, but it happens after the credits here. Uh, Brad is one of these joy mutants. He's like horrifically disfigured uh, and you have to crawl him into a house and he sees Lisa sleeping inside and then it's over. Yeah. And joyful picks up right there. And um, okay. I, I I should say too, like I've, I've got the credits running right now, like in a muted video and it's going through like, you know, music by Austin Jorgensen, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it'll say, it just says like special thanks, Martin Armstrong. And then like, right, kill, yeah. her, kill her buddy Armstrong. Uh, fun, really funny. It, uh, above Kickstarter backers, it says burn. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's nice. But yeah, joyful picks up like right there. Okay. So you get an extra ending if you didn't use any joy in the game. And I got that. That is just backstory about why, where joy came from, basically. Um, uh, They say that it makes people's innermost desires come out when they take it. So they say that in the game, aside from them feeling nothing, like during the effects of the drug, maybe it has this secondary effect of making people's innermost desires come out. And for Brad, that to me could explain why he sees Lisa everywhere, but also could explain if his biggest innermost desire is to redeem himself and get a second chance and, you know, prove he's a good person. It could be why that became such a dominating thing. If you want to ascribe that to the effects of joy. Yeah. That's left kind of up in the air. Uh, you can see there are some joy mutants that you can encounter and they don't attack you in the game. Like they'll just say they seem happy or something or like they're done or something like that. And it's kind of implied that like, once they kill enough or complete whatever their 
whatever uh, their <laughs> their focus, whatever their uh, main goal is, that they'll stop killing. It's kind of implied that because um, the first one that we have to fight to get the bike, he's not killing anybody. He's just standing there. He's just mm-hmm. sitting there. And that one guy is like admiring how beautiful and sad he is. I'm not entirely sure what that's about or if those innermost desires begin to manifest before they turn. I'm I'm honestly I'm I'm really not sure. Yeah. I mean it's just an interesting like wrinkle to throw in. It's still even if you say that that is why this dominated Brad's mind so much, why he had that that one track mind, it's still telling that that is the thing he desires the most and not buddy's well-being or buddy's, you know, autonomy or anything like that. It's still about him at the very base of it all. Oh, absolutely. I also heard, can you confirm, I also just heard real quick that the guy playing the trumpet is doing that to control the Joy Mutants? Yes, that is okay. that is canonically true. Okay. And do you want further spoilers on on that? Yeah, I I I'll take any spoilers, yeah. <laughs> That's that is but that is Buddy's dad. That's Buddy's dad. Okay. Yeah, her real name is Nancy. Oh, oh, that's who Nancy is. Okay. Yes, it's not clear who her mother is. Uh, she may have been one of the Joy Mutants or one of the people killed by the Joy Mutants. But yeah, Doctor Yado is is Buddy's dad. Interesting. There's like a there's like a showdown with him at the very end of Joyful. It's it's kind of I don't really love how Joyful ends. It's kind of it feels like it ends just to end, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it it ends with him. You know? I got you. Okay. So at the in the post credit scene with the joyless ending, uh, he says Doctor Yado says that he's going to use Nancy for something, and Nancy is Buddy. I don't know what he's using her for, but they don't say it in the game either. It's is it explained later in Joyful? It, it's definitely explained in Joyful. I am just forgetting what exactly it is right now. I'm not sure, like if he wanted her to kill everyone or if he had planned to turn her into a Joy Mutant. I'm not, I can't quite remember to be perfectly honest with you, but it is explained. I know that much. Okay. So he created joy because he wanted to take over the world, but then he had a change of heart and now he goes out and plays the trumpet to keep all the joy mutants under control or something. No, no, he's using the joy mutants. Oh, that, so that doesn't keep them, uh, that, sorry. I thought that it meant that like pacifies them. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Cause he, uh, he calls them in. Like as a uh, as pets in the next one fights with okay, him. fair enough, well, really interesting game, um especially when you start to get into brad's uh psychology in here and his motivations um because i I like that they started out noble, they got warped, and then that warped motivation just took over, basically, and you by playing as him you you want that for him for a while and then you start to see what's going on and then you uh, are forced to play out the rest of it too so i thought this this part of it this um this kind of savior syndrome this selfish behavior by brad uh, was really really good and i enjoyed that storyline as it progressed yeah and it's it's a game it it really is like disco elysium where morality really does not exist on the spectrum that we think it does, like on a 2D left to right plane, just the x-axis. It's more like a four-dimensional, not even a shape that I could think of. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's so complex and there is never really a right answer. It's really easy for us to say there's a right answer because we are so divorced from it. We are sitting at our keyboards playing a video game. And yeah. it's like, well, well, you know, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't do that. It's, well, would you? It's it's almost impossible to say. It's it's so fantastical of a situation. It's not we cannot ascertain what we would do. Right. I think post apocalyptic media is good for setting up situations like that where uh people are driven to desperation in a way that like, you know, up to this point in my life I've never <laughs> been in any kind of situation like these people in this game, but it's easy to set up those situations with this setting because people have lost so much and would probably be clinging on to anything that could possibly, you know, bring them happiness or help them find love or something like that. Uh, it's, it's something that like post-apocalyptic media is, 
really common and often like I feel like they don't use that for like the the psychological side of why people do the things they do but I think this game does get into that and it it like it's not just post apocalyptic but the extra dimension that you know it's a it's a world ruled by men well not ruled by men it's a world of men and you have this one woman and interesting choices and uh situations that arise just because of that and again credit to them uh to Jorgensen for not taking that super low hanging fruit of what this story could have been yeah i totally agree i am not somebody that engages with a ton of post apocalyptic media um it's not really a reason for it i just i don't know i just don't yeah so i i can't i can't <laughs> i can't make a lot of comparisons but i i think this is really successful i i think this writes uh to to steal a phrase from my one of my favorite youtubers I think this game does awful right, and it's. I I am just shocked that more people haven't played it. And to be quite honest, I'm even more shocked that it got a remake. Uh, well, remaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I truly thought the subject matter would be too much for anybody for any studio to say, yeah, we'll put our name behind that. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty cool that they did. I think the definitive edition is, with the exception of work harder, just like the best way to play. The PlayStation version has some stupid censorship things like they uh, they call, at least in the joyful, they call uh, alcohol soda. What? What kind of 1990s Final Fantasy shit is that? I think it's because Buddy's a kid, uh, you know, and then in uh, the painful, they call them candy cigarettes and not cigarettes. Sure. <laughs> I think that might just be in the joyful. I don't know. But yeah, other otherwise, I mean... Play play the definitive and then listen to work harder. A hundred times when you're not, yeah, when you're not <laughs> playing the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, make sure to put in the uh, the older version of that. Credit to that voice actor, but I still want to listen to the old uh, the old version of it. So, um, thank you, man, for coming on for uh, what turned out to be a very long discussion. But uh, this game has a lot to talk about, and I didn't want to. You know, there's a lot of stuff we didn't talk about too. A lot of story characters. Uh, plot beats, but I didn't want to skimp on what I thought was the important stuff. So uh, thank you for being here uh, again and going through the whole thing with me. Uh, this has been awesome. Yeah, man, of course. I, I always like coming back and this is such a cool game. I couldn't couldn't pass it up. You uh, you gave me a couple of options way back when and I saw this one and I was like, yeah, it's got to be that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And uh, a little bird told me you might be back for another game like that that jumped off the page at you uh, later on this year. So I'm looking forward to that too. But uh, for now, again, thank you for uh, for coming back. Again, another three hours of your time. Uh, we, we tend to do this, whether it's on my show or yours, we, we tend to have a lot to talk about together, but I always appreciate it. So uh, everybody listening, thank you for making it to the end. Another plug to go down in the show notes and check out Pixel Project Radio. It is worth your time. Again, if you still want more Lisa the Painful discussion, go over and listen to the Pixel Project Radio episode about this game. Uh, You'll get different perspectives, which is always good with a game like this. And there is just one thing left to say after that, and that is to tune in next week for the next game to come out of the backlog.